previously on The Dark Side of Hey Arnold. Harold Berman is a character who, much like Helga, is kind of like an onion. He has many layers of complexity that attribute to him being the way that he is. Sure, it might not be as complex as Helga's onion is, but there's still quite a bit to peel back here. He's generally portrayed as immature, cowardly, naive, dumb, and overall just kind of obnoxious. A lot of times, Harold is portrayed as the bully of the group, however, he is relatively harmless. This one definitely showed us just how far Harold is willing to go to cover for himself under scrutiny for any of his wrongdoings. Granted, blowing up a police station is a serious offense, he was literally willing to take a train down south and straight up become a hobo at the age of nine instead of facing the reality of what he had done. This one also gave us a good glimpse into what Harold's home life is like. Harold has two parents who love him dearly. Harold comes back and he gets off of the ship looking significantly heavier than he was when he left. Harold, what happened? You're as big as a house! What do you mean? Have you looked in the mirror lately? That just shows what you know. They don't allow mirrors on the ship. Well, you might want to take a gander at one on account of you're as big as a house. What are they talking about, Arnold? <sighs> Who's that guy? That's you. That's me? I guess you put on a couple of pounds. We then see poor Patty standing in the exact spot where Harold said he would meet her, but of course he is nowhere to be found. Harold ends up sitting with Sid and Stinky at lunch, and this happens. Yes, if Big Fatty tried to dance with me, I'd run for my life! <laughs> Stop it! You guys don't know what you're talking about! Her name's not Big Fatty, it's Patty! And she's not clumsy and she's not dumb! Not only that, she's smart and she's nice and she's funny. I must be crazy to listen to you guys. What do I care what you think? The only thing that matters is what I think. And what I think is, I like Patty. And if anybody's got a problem with that, I'll beat you up so bad it won't even be funny! After blowing up on Sid and Stinky, we see him walk right up to Patty and apologize for being late and ask if she still wants to sit with him for lunch. In the last episode of The Dark Side of Hey Arnold, we dug deep into the mind and psyche of Harold Berman, and boy was it a wild ride. It wasn't as emotional as the Helga episode got, but it definitely hit hard, that's for sure. If you missed that episode or any of the other episodes in this series, then you're seriously missing out. However, you are in luck because down in the description box you'll find a link to a playlist with every video in this series. Definitely check it out if you're new to this series. Also, really quick, I just want to say, I see your comments. Tons of people are requesting that I make an episode about Gerald, and to that I say, bet. But also, hold up, because there's a method to my madness. This is subject to change, but I've got at least eight other episodes planned for this series, and I'm making them in a very methodical order. Gerald will definitely get his time, and I'm telling you right now, it's gonna be an amazing video. But just be patient, because his episode is coming up in the near future. As I've continued with making this series, I've found so much love for this show. Hey Arnold has been one of my favorite shows since I was very young, but I've never taken the time to look at it under the lens that we're looking at it in this series, and it's definitely changed my perception of this show. I've come to realize that the writers of this show definitely knew exactly what they were doing when they produced it. Hey Arnold is unlike any other show that was playing on Nickelodeon during its time. It took regular, everyday kids and put them in more often than not really serious and tense situations that one might face in real life. They weren't afraid to go there. They never turned a cheek to the dark side of being a kid in the big city. It's a show that stared negativity and fear in the face and didn't blink for a second. All things considered, this show is just perfect in many different ways. The colorful cast of complex characters is definitely one of the most necessary elements in making it the show that we know. Making these characters have layers the way that they do really adds value to the quality of the show. One aspect of this show that I love is how they tend to put certain characters in as what seems at first like shtick or just for light comedic effect, but at some point, 
they almost always end up adding additional elements to that character's personality or their background. There are many cases of them leaving no stone unturned as for the background of these characters, which is why today, on our nostalgic walk down memory lane, we're going to dive deep into the mind and history of a character who seemed like a side character for comedic value, but ended up getting some additional background and even was the main character in a few episodes. This is The Dark Side of Hey Arnold. Eugene Horowitz. He's a boy who, in many ways, is a walking contradiction. He's a fourth grader who's widely known for his cheerful and upbeat demeanor and attitude. However, despite his positive disposition, he's also known to encounter a high level of misfortune and is very danger prone. It's rather ironic because his name literally means born lucky. Yet, this lucky child was born on Friday the 13th of March 1987, and has been dubbed a jinx by the rest of the kids in his class. He is a rather socially inept kid who never fails to be optimistic to a fault. Aesthetically, I'd say that Eugene is an interesting looking character. His head is full of red hair and has a rather interesting shape to it. He's often seen rocking flip-flops with socks, and is seen on multiple occasions with his underwear showing in a constant state of a wedgie, most likely due to the fact that he's constantly bullied in school. In a lot of ways, Eugene is a very inspiring character. Though life has handed him not the best hand, he plays that hand with a smile and a positive outlook. He's a character that throughout many episodes is used as a comedic device, usually being the butt of a joke, getting injured, or causing an accident of some sort. He's more often than not kind of a side character. We see him in many scenes. Throughout the totality of the series, he appears in a majority of the episodes, yet it's common for him to feature in the episode without providing any dialogue or adding any substance to the story itself. However, today, we're focusing on the episodes that tended to revolve around Eugene in one way or another. Taking it from the top, we're going to look at a few episodes that kind of highlight how much of a jinx that Eugene can be. The first episode we're checking out is the Season 1 episode, World Records. This episode starts out with Arnold on his stoop with all of his friends while they're reading through a book of world records. Deepest hole, 7,265 feet? Wow! Most cats on a single string, 11,284! Most chocolate chips in a single cookie, 2,684.6! Alright, chocolate! <laughs> Most pogs on a pogo stick. Fattest worm! Most bones broken in a single bicycle accident! Helga walks up rather menacingly, basically saying that it's a book full of morons acting like geeks and weirdos. She tries to convince them that nobody cares about any of these records, and that them reading the book is a waste of time. Helga tells Phoebe to come with her as they have more important things to do, specifically throwing rocks down by the river. The other kids walk off seemingly convinced by Helga. Helga's wrong about this book. I don't know. She made a couple of good points. I mean, who really cares how many sardines a guy can clean it out? Gerald, the people in this book are the best in the world. They're at the forefront of human achievement. To be listed in the Book of World Records is to get a little piece of immortality. Uh-huh. You want to go down the river and throw rocks? Gerald, don't you see what I'm trying to say? If you and I broke a world record, we'd be listed in this book forever. After just a little bit of convincing, Gerald agrees to help Arnold break a record. They start by trying to break the world record for walking backwards. So how far you think we've gone? About a mile. What's the record? Let me check. Franny Caudell walked backwards from Santa Monica, California, to Istanbul. 8,773 miles. Oh. Let's try something else. Next up, they try to break the world record for most times bouncing a ball on your head. When that fails, they go for hula hooping, which also is a fail. Gerald and Arnold end up back where they started and discussing ideas. How about flaming limbo dancing? You kidding? I don't want to burn my belly. Okay, what about chainsaw juggling? Skip on down. Mansell Bees? Forget it, Arnold. We're never gonna find a world record we can break. You guys still trying to break a world record? Yeah. yeah. You don't have to do that kind of stuff. You should do stuff you already know you can do. Stuff that doesn't take any real talent. You know, kid stuff. Like, uh... Most days without taking a bath! 
<laughs> yeah! Arnold and Gerald end up inspired by this idea, so naturally they just stop bathing, but their stench is so foul that they end up attracting all of the neighborhood animals. They end up failing when all of the residents from the boarding house get fed up with their odor and ambush them with an impromptu bath. Feeling defeated, they sit on the stoop yet again as Helga explains that the two of them will never break a world record. You're right, Helga. I am? The two of us can't. What we need is more kids! The highest pyramid of kids. Next up, they decide to attempt the longest game of Crack the Whip, which goes pretty well until this happens. This is not safe. After that fails, Arnold gets the bright idea to attempt the record for most kids riding a single bicycle. Arnold and the gang end up on his stoop again. Harold says that he's fed up and that he's gonna try to break his own record. Brainy decides to join him, but everyone else stays behind with Arnold. This really bites. I'm not sure how many more records we can try to break. I'm game. Come on, you guys. We can't give up. There's plenty of records we haven't tried yet. Look, Arnold, wake up. Up, okay? I mean, come on! How many things do you have to fail at? How many windmills have to knock you on your butt before you realize you're just an average kid with a bunch of average friends and you can't do anything better than anybody else? Helga being rude inspires Arnold and he starts talking about how uniquely talented all of his friends are. He says that no one can roll a sleeping bag tighter than Stinky. Phoebe has an encyclopedic knowledge on Italian sauces, and Gerald is the only person who can chop up a zucchini with his mom's car keys. Arnold says that they have to combine those seemingly useless talents into one idea to make something so cool that no one else can ever compete. Great! So Stinky can roll something, Phoebe knows sauces, and Geraldo's a human vegematic. So what? So, so we'll cook something! <laughs> yeah, right. What? Like the world's biggest casserole? <laughs> biggest donut! Yeah! Biggest sundae! Aww. Yeah! Biggest crawdad! Yeah! <laughs> no! The world's biggest pizza puff! <gasps> Arnold puts Stinky in charge of the crust, Phoebe in charge of the sauce, and Gerald in charge of the toppings as they all jump into action. Meanwhile, we cut over to Harold who's with Brainy and trying to beat a world record. He plans to set the record for longest ride on a 25 cent pony ride as Brainy goes off to collect quarters from people. Back at the boarding house, Arnold and basically the entire community are working together to make the world's largest pizza puff. The group stands by watching as the pizza puff cooks. Gerald makes a comment about hoping that they put enough baking soda, and Phoebe says that 150 teaspoons should be plenty. But then, Sid chimes up saying that he didn't know TSP meant teaspoons, and he thought it meant 10 square pounds. Look out! She's gonna blow! <laughs> Arnold and Gerald feel defeated. Gerald sits in sorrow, saying that maybe they're not special or unique, and maybe they'll never break a world record. After sitting on it for a sec, Arnold gets an interesting idea as he runs off, saying that he has a letter to write. We fast forward an unknown amount of time, where we see the entire town working together to clean up pizza sauce when this happens. We did it! We did it! I say you did it! 
and we're still cleaning it up too. Arnold, what in the world is that? Now what football has? From the people at the Book of World Records. They say they're going to put us in the book. What? Huh? Why are they going to do that? We didn't break any records. Oh, yes, we did. We broke the record for most attempts to get in the Book of World Records. They say we're the most determined neighborhood they've ever heard of. Everyone celebrates, even Helga, and the episode comes to an end with everyone dancing outside of the boarding house. This episode feels like a good, mild starting point before we get deep into the nitty gritty. There's a couple of things to gather from this episode. First and foremost, this episode definitely shows us how much of a jinx Eugene tends to be, but honestly, it kind of feels like none of this is his fault and a good majority of it isn't really a result of bad luck. When the group tried making the highest pyramid of kids, they make it seem as if Eugene was the cause of it failing, which very may well be the case, but look at the layout here. They clearly didn't think this through. On the bottom row, you've got Iggy, Sid, Eugene, Robert, and Park. Now, with all due respect, I feel like they could have done a better job at organization here. Harold definitely should have been at the bottom. He's strong and stable and would have been perfect for Eugene's spot. I would have also put Stinky, Sid, Park, and Gerald down there too. The next row up would definitely have been Iggy, Robert, Arnold, and Joey in my opinion. The row above that should have probably been Sheena, Rhonda, and Curly. Above them would be Nadine and Phoebe, and of course Eugene on top. My logic being that the one they've all dubbed the Jinx should be saved for last, right? That way, if he fails to get on, it's not going to take everyone else out in the process as it did with him on the bottom. Also, he's possibly the smallest and thinnest kid in class, so with his lightweight, he would have been a perfect candidate for the top spot. After that though, they ended up doing the world's longest game of Crack the Whip, which might I point out I've literally never heard of, but it sounds kind of fun. With this one, Eugene literally got in and within seconds was green in the face and ready to vomit. Now this doesn't really have anything to do with being a jinx or bad luck or really anything like that. It's literally due to motion sickness, which Eugene has no control over. So honestly, if I was Arnold, I would have taken his place considering they didn't attempt to add any other kids after Eugene, assuming that they were going for the record of longest length of time played and not most amount of people playing. Sure, he may have been green in the face, but Eugene didn't vomit though. What ruined it was the fact that he went flying and got hurt. Now, this one is a little bit ridiculous. I feel that Eugene isn't fully to blame for what happened. Sure, maybe he should have held on to Sid a little better, but the same could be said for Sid to be honest. The entire school labeled Eugene as a jinx and treats him differently because they truly believe him to have just terrible luck. You'd think that with that in mind, Sid would hold on a little tighter Eugene while cracking the whip. Lastly, we see them attempting the record for most kids riding a single bicycle. This one literally didn't even involve Eugene. However, his bad luck did shine a bit when we see the bike go down a hill and Eugene gets taken out as a casualty of the incident. That one is actually a pretty good example of his bad luck, I can't lie. Eugene was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. However, I don't see why Eugene turned around and ran away the way he did instead of running to the left or the right or even just jumping to the side or something. He only got hit by the bike because his attempt at evading was just trash and again, wrong place, wrong time. Moving on from that though, we see the group discussing the next record to attempt and something interesting happens. While most of the kids are feeling defeated and ready to give up, we see Eugene in a wheelchair with basically a full body cast, but he's still enthusiastic about pursuing the next record. This is something we're going to circle back to a little later on, so I want you to keep that in the back of your mind, but this speaks volumes about Eugene's outlook on life and his ability to keep on keeping on through the tough times. Everyone else was feeling defeated because they failed to break any records and they were ready to give up for the most part. Meanwhile, Eugene faced nearly the same exact failure and got severely injured multiple times in the process, yet he didn't give up at any point. Of anything, we can say that Eugene definitely has a good attitude. Another thing that I'd like to point out is how ironic it is that the giant pizza puff played out the way it did. It went great until it just didn't all of a sudden. We learned that Sid accidentally put way too much baking soda, which caused a chemical reaction and the whole thing exploded. Eugene, the alleged jinx, didn't do it. It was Sid, the same kid who couldn't hold on to Eugene tight enough during their game of Crack the Whip and caused him to get injured. I gotta say, it does make me glad that they didn't make Eugene the one to ruin the pizza puff, but I can't help but wonder, what if it isn't Eugene who's the jinx, but it's actually Sid? 
I don't have any other evidence to back that up other than this episode, but it had me truly wondering and rethinking everything I knew about this show. However, that's another topic that we're going to touch on later in a way, so keep that theory in mind as well. One last thing about this episode that I just can't ignore is the part where pizza sauce rains from the sky. Literally, the chemical reaction caused pizza sauce to rain from above like in the song Raining Blood by Slayer. It was pretty crazy how it basically covered the whole town, but the big thing that really stuck with me was that sequence with Harold. We see him on his 25 cent pony ride as he gets covered in pizza sauce, and without question or even a shred of hesitation, he licks the sauce. Sure, sure, okay, it was just pizza sauce and it didn't cause any harm, but what if it wasn't? What if it was like bodily fluids or something gross like that? I get that they did that just for the comedic effect, but it kind of blew my mind seeing how he just licked the strange liquid falling from the sky with no questions asked. That clearly has nothing to do with Eugene, but for the sake of reviewing this episode, I just had to bring it up because that was kind of gnarly. Moving on from there, we're going to check out another episode that relates to the theory of Eugene being a jinx, and that's going to be the Season 3 episode, Roller Coaster. This episode starts out with Arnold and all of his friends at Dino Land preparing for the best day ever. The kids can't decide what they want to do first. Sid recommends the pterodactyl egg cups, but then this happens. Forget it guys, we can't go, huh? Why not? Because Arnold, look who's on the ride, Eugene, the living jinx. Oh, come on. He's just a regular kid like you and me and everybody else. Oh, yeah? Take a good look, Arnold. Eugene overhears Stinky and the other kids talking about how much of a jinx he is, and you can just see how much it crushes his spirits as he walks away sadly. Fast forward a bit, and we see Helga hyping everyone up to go on the newly renovated Tyrannoscarus Rex when this happens. Yeah! I've got an arm game too, guys! We can all go together! It'll be great! Come on, guys! If you don't line up now, you'll miss your chance to get a seat! Aren't you guys coming? Are you kidding? Not with the all-time jinx of the century, Eugene. But Eugene's our friend. What's your point? We should stick by him, shouldn't we? Oh, criminy. I smell a speech about virtues and nobility coming on. Helga, I, I just think it's stupid not to go on rides you're all dying to go on just because Eugene's on it. Sid admits that he sees Arnold's point and that it is kind of stupid not to go for that reason. However, he openly states that he's still not going because they'll all be killed for sure. Arnold dismisses them and goes to get in the ride. Don't do it, Arnold! Whatever you do, he's a jinx! Stinky, I'm getting on the roller coaster, and I'm going to prove once and for all that Eugene is not a jinx. Arnold, if you don't make it back, can I have your tokens? I'm gonna make it back, Harold. Eugene and I are gonna ride the Tyrannoscarus Rex, and nothing bad is gonna happen. So, can I have your tokens? <sighs> yeah! The ride takes off and everything goes great, though you can tell that Arnold is apprehensive as seen through the nervous look on his face. They reach a point where the roller coaster is just about to descend from the highest point, but right at that point, a rope connecting the cars that Arnold and Eugene are on to the rest of the cars snaps and they end up stranded at the highest point on the ride. Gee, Arnold, you don't think we're stuck, do you? Of course not. Move. Please move. Oh, I'm sure everything's going to be fine. The Dinoland people are probably taking care of the problem right now. Sure they are. We'll be rolling in no time. We have a slight mechanical problem. Nothing to worry about. We'll get you rolling in no time. Oh, they always say that. Oh, like the time I was stuck in the elevator at the library, or the time I was trapped in the helicopter at the Air and Space Museum. Arnold tells Eugene not to worry, but Eugene keeps a positive mindset looking at the bright side of things, where Arnold is clearly worried and stressing hard up there. Meanwhile, all of their friends are down below watching and talking about how doomed they are. We see some employees talking about how they don't know what the problem is and that they can't figure it out. However, they use a megaphone to tell Arnold and Eugene the exact opposite, saying that they've got it figured out and they'll have them down in just a matter of minutes. I think they bought it. Someday, Arnold, we'll look back on this and laugh. <laughs> Yeah. And besides, the man said we'd be on the ground in a few minutes. Eugene, 
That was an hour ago. Oh, don't worry. If there's any more delay, they'll just bring in a cherry picker. Boys, you're doing great. I just wanted to let you know that we're bringing in a cherry picker to rescue you. It'll be here in no time. Eugene starts talking to Arnold about how cool it was the multiple times that he's been rescued by a cherry picker when this happens. You know, I was kind of surprised you decided to come on the roller coaster with me, Arnold. Why did you? Well, because no one else would and you didn't want me to feel bad? Well, sort of. That's so nice of you. You're a real pal. Especially considering my being so unlucky and all. I don't know what you're talking about, Eugene. It's okay, Arnold. You don't have to pretend. I know what everyone says about me. They all call me a big jinx, don't they? Nobody says that, Eugene. Come on, Arnold. I've heard it my whole life. Arnold tries to tell Eugene that he isn't a jinx, but Eugene says that no matter what he does, something always goes wrong. Naturally, while Arnold is trying to make him feel better, this happens. Hey Arnold! Didn't I tell you Eugene was the living jinx? Yeah, and you said you were going to prove that he weren't. Told ya! Can you see my house from there? Give me that! Hours pass, and it starts to get dark. Arnold and Eugene are still up there, and Eugene tries to break some tension by singing the Itsy Bitsy Spider song, saying that it always calms him down. Right at that moment, the cherry picker shows up, and a firefighter by the name of Lucky shows up to save them. I just want to assure you that I've got everything under control. Nothing can go wrong. No oh, mercy, no. No, no, not again. Is there a problem, Lucky? Of course not. Everything's fine. There's no problems when Lucky's around. Oh, no! Back on the ground, Helga approaches the employees, asking what they're going to do about it, and they say that there's a professional fireman up there who will talk to the boys and keep them calm. I don't want to fall. I'll be crushed like a bug. Please, someone, please. Don't worry, Lucky. Someone will be up to save us in no time. No time doesn't mean anything. They just say that when they have no idea how long it'll take to really save you. The truth is we're all going to fall and be crushed like bugs. If you're scared, I know something that can calm you down. What? Out came the sun and dried up all the rain. And the itsy bitsy spider went out and spout again. As the cherry picker starts to collapse more, Arnold has to think quick. He sees a rope on the wall behind Eugene, and he instructs Eugene to get the rope and to make a lasso that he can pass to Lucky. Eugene is apprehensive, saying what if he falls or if I drop the rope, citing that he is a jinx, but Arnold calms him, telling him that he can do this. Please, let me do something right, just this once. Let me not be a jinx. Oh please, hurry. Pull it tight. That's it, Eugene. Uh, uh. Thank you, oh, thank you. Just then, the employee finally figures out the control mechanism and gets the roller coaster started again as Eugene, Arnold, and Lucky ride it down safely. You really surprised us, Eugene. You the man, Eugene. Hey, you want to go on the Mr. Gator ride with us? Sure, guys. I'd love to. <laughs> First of all, this is a great episode. Just had to get that out of the way. This episode is one that always made me feel bad for Eugene. In the beginning, we see Eugene on the pterodactyl egg cups when it goes haywire and sends him flying. Before that happens, Sid says that he isn't going on the ride because Eugene was on it, with the reason being because Eugene is a jinx. Now that statement and those actions right there are literal proof to Sid changing the way that he does things based on the fact that Eugene is involved and he thinks Eugene is a jinx. The other kids follow suit. They acknowledge that Eugene is seen as a jinx and they change their plans literally based on that one fact. 
Now, reflecting on the last episode that we checked out, I just have to point out how ridiculous it is that Sid didn't grab Eugene more firm while playing Crack the Whip. In this episode, we see him change his approach based on the fact that Eugene was in proximity, and I still can't get past the fact that Sid didn't do that in the World Records episode. Same goes for all the other kids. If they knew Eugene was a jinx, why did they let him be on the bottom of the pyramid when they were trying to make the tallest kid pyramid? I know, weird hill to die on, but the contradiction is just driving me a little nuts right now. We also need to keep in mind the circumstances of what happened to Eugene. The pterodactyl egg cup ride broke and literally almost killed him. After that, the Tyrannosaurus Rex roller coaster broke and left Arnold and Eugene stranded. Now, I can't help but wonder, did those things happen solely because Eugene is a jinx? Or did they happen due to negligence by the theme park? We see just how unprofessional and seemingly inexperienced the employees are during the whole sequence of them trying to get Eugene and Arnold down. I'd imagine that with this theme park hiring people like that to run the rides, the odds of them performing proper maintenance on these rides is very low. So in all reality, is it Eugene's fault that this happened, or is he just a victim of circumstance? Who knows? But I do know that I truly feel bad for Eugene due to his reputation. Everyone blatantly calls him a jinx and just completely disregards his feelings in the way that they do it. We see the group of kids talking behind his back and he overhears them, which truly hurts his feelings as evidenced by the way he walks away so sadly. From there, we see Eugene sadly explaining to Arnold that he knows how all the other kids feel about him. He knows that they avoid him because he's a jinx. Then, as Arnold is trying to make him feel better, the kids take a megaphone from below and start yelling into it about how much of a jinx Eugene is for not only Eugene himself, but also everyone in the park to hear as well. There was no thought as to how that would make Eugene feel, no consideration to if it was going to affect his confidence or his perception of himself. They were solely focused on basically saying I told you so to Arnold. Speaking of Arnold though, his interactions with Eugene are a true testament to how good-natured and kind-spirited Arnold is. In this episode, we see Arnold blatantly dismissing the belief that Eugene is a jinx and saying that he's going to prove everyone wrong by going on the ride with him. That would be a constant theme in many Eugene episodes. There are many times that we see Arnold go to bat for Eugene and attempt to either prove that he isn't a jinx or just to simply try to make things better for Eugene. So with that being said, we're going to move on to our next topic and that's going to be Arnold's interactions with Eugene and his attempts to help him. Starting out with the season 2 episode, Eugene's Pet. This episode starts out at PS 118 during show and tell. All my life, I've wanted to pet you guys, someone I could call my own. But my dog ran away, I was allergic to my cat, and my rabbit gave me nightmares. I thought I was never going to get a pet of my own, but then I found Henry. I've had him for six months, and nothing bad's happened to him. Henry's my best friend. I feed him, I talk to him, and I bought him this neat plastic castle with my allowance. Show everyone how you play hide and seek, Henry. Eugene goes and sits down, and Mr. Simmons calls on Arnold to come up and present his show and tell next. I bought this yo-yo last week, and the guy showed me how to do cat's cradle. Ooh. Gosh! And I can shoot the moon, too. Wow! <laughs> He's croaked, Eugene. I'm sorry, Eugene. I'm really sorry. It's a trick. It's a new trick. <laughs> he learned a new trick, okay. Eugene is straight up in denial about the fact that his fish is dead. We fast forward to Arnold and Eugene in the bathroom as Eugene is about to flush the goldfish down the toilet. You gotta do it, Eugene. It's time. Henry? Oh, I can't do it, Arnold! <laughs> I had Henry since he was a little baby goldfish! Okay, uh, I'll flush it for you. Here. Wait! You really loved him, huh? Yeah. Arnold suggests that they bury the fish somewhere that Eugene can visit him, and we fast forward to the funeral for Henry the goldfish. Everyone stands around the massive hole that they dug for him, and Eugene asks for someone to give a eulogy. Helga offers, but Eugene denies, saying that he feels like she didn't really appreciate Henry. Instead, Eugene asks Gerald to say a few words about him. Henry wasn't the biggest or the best looking goldfish, so no one can buy him for a long time. He thought he'd never find a home. 
Then one day, a lonely boy came into the pet store. He was kind of a geek, really. But he needed a pet, and he wanted it. And, and that was the start of a beautiful friendship. Yes. As Gerald continues giving his eulogy, we see a cat jump down into the hole and take the fish as it runs off, leaving Eugene devastated. Later on, we see Arnold and Gerald walking with Eugene as Arnold says that he feels terrible and that he wants to make it up to Eugene. They decide to go to the pet store to shop. Uh, can I see your bird? Oh! Welcome to my world. Hamsters are pretty good. Yeah, and so friendly. Oh, bad chemistry. Can't fight that. After neither of those pets work out, Gerald suggests that Eugene get a snake to add some machismo to his style. Eugene is apprehensive, but the employee says that they're just harmless garter snakes. Try it on for size. See? It pulls your whole look together. Hey guys, I, I think he likes me. Look guys, he's giving me a hug. <laughs> guys, I can't breathe. <sighs> After that doesn't work out, they all leave as Eugene is just bummed. He feels like there's just kids who can't have pets and that he's one of them. Arnold feels really guilty, but Gerald assures him that Eugene will be fine tomorrow, simply saying that he always bounces back. We cut to the next day at school, where this happens. This can't be good, Gerald. Uh, what you doing, Eugene? I brought my hippo to school. Isn't he neat? I don't see any hippo. Albert's right here. You can't hide a hippo. Eugene is left out in the rain while all of the other kids go back inside. And he slept. I guess Eugene was just hanging on by a thread, and losing that little fish was the last straw. I feel terrible about this, Gerald. Why did it have to be Eugene's fish? Later on, we see Arnold and Gerald approach Eugene as they ask what he's doing. We learn that Eugene's imaginary pet hippo ran away, so he's putting up signs just in case anyone finds him. Man, losing a pretend pet? Now that's pathetic. Eugene, maybe you should talk to your mom about Albert. She should know about this. Oh, she's not a hippo person, Arnold. Anyway, I got a lot more flyers to put up. Later that night, we see Arnold at the dinner table as his grandpa's serving up some fish for dinner. Arnold says that he doesn't want to eat it, and his grandpa can sense that something's wrong. He asks him what's up, and Arnold explains how he accidentally murdered Eugene's fish, and how Eugene is so sad now. I don't get it, Grandpa. Why does everything bad happen to Eugene? Eh, some kids are just plain unlucky. Bad things always happen to them. I guess all you can do is be a friend to them in his time of need. But most importantly, never go to Vegas with that kid or fly in an airplane with him. It's just not fair, Grandpa. I can't stand seeing Eugene so alone. We're all alone. That's life! Grandpa gives Arnold a talk about as long as you have your dreams and fantasies to hold on to, you'll continue to move on. This makes Arnold think, and later that night, he falls asleep, dreaming that he's scuba diving in a giant fishbowl. He sees himself swimming with Eugene's pet fish when the large suit of armor falls and kills the fish. Except this time, the fish takes shelter in Arnold's hair, where it inflates into a huge fish that Eugene ends up riding into the sunset. Arnold wakes up invigorated with an idea of how to remedy the situation. That morning, we see him, Gerald, and Eugene go to the aquarium. Gee, thanks for bringing me to the aquarium, Arnold. But I don't get it. Why are we here? Eugene, see that angelfish? I talked to the people at the aquarium, and from now on, that angelfish is going to be your pet. Wow! See, it's official. You can come down and visit him anytime. Arnold, this is so great. You're the neatest friend anybody ever had. Look, he waved at me. I'm going to call him. Angel. Eugene says that it's perfect. The fish is in a safe tank surrounded by security guards, so nothing bad can ever happen to him. He's totally safe 
husband there, and I can come see him any time I want. Oh, I'll tell him my secrets, and we'll take pictures of him for my wall. We'll grow up together. Don't say a word, Gerald. Hi, Angel. Hi hey, wh where'd he go? Uh, Angel's hiding, Eugene. He's uh in the back. This episode is just tragic. This poor kid finally found the perfect pet, and after six months of no issue, it dies tragically. Seeing Eugene so heartbroken was definitely upsetting, but yet again, the things that happened to him in this episode weren't necessarily his fault. When his fish died, that actually had nothing to do with Eugene. Technically, it was Arnold's fault that the fish died. So far, I've learned that Eugene, more often than not, tends to be a victim of circumstance. Sure, you can chalk it up to bad luck or being a jinx, but all in all, these things that happen are usually out of Eugene's control and tend to just be a case of terrible timing. At one point, this episode takes a really dark turn. After the goldfish died, it was like something changed in Eugene's brain. He ended up fabricating an imaginary pet, the hippo which he named Elbert. This is an interesting concept. Is Eugene just a normal kid who decided to have an imaginary friend? Or did he genuinely believe that the hippo was real? He literally missed school because he was too busy outside with his imaginary hippo. He had hippo food that he was putting in a bowl and was even holding an umbrella over the bowl when it started raining. Part of me genuinely wonders if Eugene knows that the hippo wasn't real. Everything about his demeanor and the way he was responding to Arnold and Gerald would lead me to believe that in his mind the hippo actually existed. The depressing icing on the cake of sadness though, Eugene's imaginary pit hippo straight up ran away. Let that sink in for a sec. Eugene has such bad luck that even his imaginary pet hippo ran away. Bear in mind that, again, this is imaginary. Eugene came up with this in his head. He imagined the hippo running away. That leads me to so many questions and theories, but more than anything, it speaks volumes to how self-aware Eugene is. Apparently, he knows that he has bad luck. It's no secret to him that bad things happen to him, so much so that he even imagined his own imaginary friend running away. Overall, it's just really sad. However, I really do appreciate Arnold in this episode. Sure, he accidentally murdered Eugene's goldfish, but he had nothing but good intentions throughout the entire episode. It really resonated with me when Arnold was at the table with his grandpa and he found himself asking why is it that bad things always happen to Eugene? Arnold was deep in a moral dilemma trying to understand why Eugene always gets the short end of the stick in life. That was kind of a breath of fresh air. Arnold really is a good person. So far we've seen him put himself on the line by getting on a roller coaster with Eugene, and now we've seen him try to help Eugene with his pet dilemma. This episode is definitely one that showed us just how good of a friend Arnold is. And though things didn't necessarily work out in the end, it showed us that Eugene is lucky to have a friend like Arnold. Moving on from there, we're going to tackle one of the first Eugene-centered episodes in the series. That's going to be the Season 1 episode, Eugene's Bike. The episode starts out with Arnold in the jungle, chasing after a butterfly, when all of a sudden he gets scared by a lion that turns into a gorilla that turns into a cheetah. He falls down a waterfall, then he wakes up to the sound of Gerald talking to him, and that's when we learn that this is just Arnold daydreaming as him and Gerald walk to school together. Hey Arnold! Hey Gerald! Wanna see my albino worm collection? I call this one Pinky. Uh, no thanks, Billy. Okay, but you don't know what you're missing. Look, you guys! I got a new scab! If you squirt real hard, it looks like Texas! That's nice, Sheena. The crusty part's the Alamo! That's disgusting! Uh, nougats? None for me. I had a big breakfast. Gerald says that he thinks they've reached the end of the dork parade, but we hear the sound of a horn honking as this happens. Here comes Eugene! I stand corrected! Am I seeing thing? Nope, that's Eugene, all right. And he's riding a really cool bike. What you do? Rob a bike store? <laughs> no, it's Flag Day, and my family exchanges gifts. Eugene says that all his life he's wanted a bike like this. It has shiny metallic paint, 
lots of gears so he doesn't have to pump hard when going uphill, and thick tires so that he can run over glass. He says that it's his dream bike and he wanted it more than wealth or world peace, but there's just one thing it needs to make it perfect, as he pulls out a card to attach to the frame so it sounds like a motorcycle when the card hits the moving spokes. I guess every dork has his day. Yeah. Be there in a second, Gerald. Eugene runs up to his bike, just devastated. Arnold apologizes and says that it was just an accident. We then see Eugene crying and throwing a fit when a man is throwing the bike into the trash. Man, no. I feel terrible about this, Gerald. Look, Arnold, it wasn't your fault. Stuff like this always happens to the geeky kids. And of all the kids in the school, Eugene's gotta be the geekiest. You can say that again. Hey, where's Pinky? Pinky? Anybody see my Pinky? You. Later on, as it pours rain outside, we see Arnold climb into the dumpster, and next thing you know, he's at home playing mad scientist with the bike as he cuts it up, welds it, and paints it red in an effort to make Eugene a brand new bike out of the pieces. Ow, Arnold. It's beautiful. Thanks. It is kind of nice, isn't it? Nice? Heck, it's better than ever. <laughs> you didn't have to do this, Arnold. Yeah, but I wanted to. Wow, Arnold. You're a pal. I'm going to take it for a ride right now. Hey, wait. Don't forget this. Just then, Arnold's amazing pet pig, Abner, runs up holding something in his mouth, which Arnold realizes is the brake cable for the bike that he forgot to install. I'm a bird. I'm a plane. I'm... About to be hurt very badly. We see Arnold visit Eugene in the hospital. He apologizes, but Eugene says that he doesn't need to because he didn't do anything. It was just a thing that happened. Arnold goes to give Eugene some chocolates that he brought him, and this happens. Here, let me help you with that. Yeah! Oh no, I'm sorry. Here, let me take that. Help! Help! Man, I'm sorry. I'll just, no, no. Arnold, please. You don't have to. Please, just sit down there. Right over there. Look, Eugene. Somehow I'm gonna make it all up to you. I don't know how yet, but I'm gonna do it. You'll see. Ah, <sighs> what a guy. As Arnold runs out and slams the door, we see the number 9 on the door flip upside down, turning it into a 6. Here it is. 336. Tonsillectomy. Let's do it. Back at home, Arnold is laying in bed and thinking. He recalls back to when he was still in diapers at daycare. We see him on the teeter-totter with Eugene when Gerald calls him, and as Arnold gets up, Eugene falls and gets hurt. After that, we fast forward a few years later, in school. We see Helga antagonizing Arnold with a crab from the classroom aquarium, and when Arnold bats it away, the crab ends up attacking Eugene in the face. Then, in art class, while Arnold is using glue to make a picture, he sets down the tin next to Eugene's frosting, causing Eugene to accidentally stick his finger in it and eat some of the glue, humiliating him in front of the entire class. Arnold gets up out of bed, saying that every dork deserves his day, and that he's gonna give that dork his day. Hi there, Arnold. Hey Eugene, what happened to your voice? I don't know. There was some kind of mix-up. They took my tonsils out by mistake. That's terrible. No, not really. You don't need them anyway. I kind of wish they would have left my spleen, though. Listen, Eugene, I just want you to know I'm sorry for everything. The teeter-totter, the crab, the paste. Huh? I don't know what you're talking about. But I figured out a way to pay you back. I'm going to take you out for one full day where nothing bad happens at all. Arnold promises Eugene a day full of non-stop, action-packed fun with nothing bad happening. Arnold runs home and tells Eugene that he'll pick him up in the morning. We then get a montage of the two of them going to a baseball game, and on the way, Eugene falls down a manhole. 
They get to the stadium and watch the game as we see Eugene get beaned right in the face by a fly ball. Then, over at the park, we see Eugene eating a hot dog as it gets caught in his throat and he starts to choke. Arnold gives him the Heimlich maneuver and the hot dog goes flying out of his mouth and ends up ricocheting and getting Eugene right in the eye. Then, lastly, at the end of the day, we see Eugene trying to use a tower viewer on the pier as it breaks off of its perch, sending him flying down to the ocean below. Sorry, Eugene. I guess we shouldn't have taken that ferry ride. Oh, that's okay. You couldn't have known I get motion sickness. No, Eugene, I'm really sorry. Arnold says that he feels so bad. He tells Eugene that he just wanted to pay him back for all the trouble that he caused, but he just made it a terrible day for him. Are you kidding me, Arnold? I ate hot dogs in the park. I almost caught a home run ball hit by Studs McGee. I watched the sunset on the river. And I even got to swim in the river. By accident, sorta. I had a great time. You know, nobody's ever done anything like this for me before. Eugene gets on the bus to go home, and the bus driver straight up closes the door on him, causing his arm to get stuck in the door of the bus as they drive off, which is where the episode ends. This one is interesting to dissect as it really shines a light on Eugene as a character and his mindset about the world and life in general. Let's be honest, that whole day was misfortune after misfortune and was overall just terrible, as was the day before. Literally, Eugene's brand new bike was destroyed, he got in a horrific accident that put him in the hospital where he straight up had his tonsils and spleen mistakenly removed. That's just wrong on so many levels. Like, the bike breaking and the accident I can get past and comprehend. But that whole thing at the hospital is just unacceptable. First of all, this surgeon should know his way around the hospital that he works at. He should have known that he was at the wrong room, and even if he didn't, it's his job as a medical professional to make sure that he's talking to and working on the correct person. It's kind of funny though, they play it off like it was just a thing that happened and Eugene just moved past it, but like, in all reality, that hospital would be sitting on a fat lawsuit and his family would probably win a massive settlement that would most likely have them set for life. After that though, we get a glimpse into the past, which tells us that it's always been that way. Eugene has always faced misfortunes, even since he was straight up in diapers. I mean, come on, the kid was straight up born on Friday the 13th. He's had an unfortunate life seemingly since the day he was born. During that day when him and Arnold hung out though, something really amazing happened. Not surprisingly, the day was terrible, just accident after accident, but that didn't bother Eugene. As morbid as it is, that's his life. He's just used to bad things happening to him again and again. But he literally refused to let that ruin his day. Regardless of any misfortune, he enjoyed his day with Arnold and had a blast. This, all in all, says so much about Eugene's character and how he looks at life. He said that no one has ever done anything that nice for him. Eugene isn't used to that. He doesn't have anyone to just spend an entire day trying to make sure that he has a good time. But as unsuccessful as it was, Arnold spent the entirety of his day doing just that. I have to bring it up though, this says just as much about Arnold as it does about Eugene. This early on episode is a good example of Arnold's ethics, conscience, and morals. Arnold's conscience is racked with the guilt of causing so much harm to Eugene, even by accident. It was all he could think about, so what did he do? He tried to give that dork his day, to put it in Arnold's terms. That gesture was a huge one, and Eugene definitely saw it that way as well. It's almost inspiring how, even in the face of issue after issue, Eugene still keeps his chin up and continues to live his life the best he can. However, you have to admit how dark just the premise of a character like Eugene is in the first place. This kid's entire role is just being the butt of a joke, being the punching bag, or just having bad things happen to him in general. The writers of the show paint Eugene's life out to be nine years of constant misfortune and accidents, and honestly, even though he has people like Arnold who empathize with him, it's still really sad. Next up, we're going to check out one last episode that highlights Arnold's want to help Eugene, and that's going to be the season four episode, Eugene's Birthday. 
This episode starts out with Eugene and Arnold walking down the street as Eugene talks to Arnold about how excited he is for his birthday. Sounds like fun, Eugene. Of course, it won't be a perfect party. It won't? See, I've always wanted a surprise party. I sure love surprises, Arnold! Oh! I'm okay. Arnold tells Eugene that he wouldn't miss his birthday party for the world, as Eugene proceeds to trip over a bunch of oranges he knocks over. We see the two continue walking as Eugene tells Arnold that all he has to do now is mail out the invitations, as Eugene then proceeds to fall down a manhole. Take these, would you, Arnold? Thanks. Good thing I didn't drop them. You know, why don't I keep these invitations, Eugene? Okay. Yeah, I could mail them for you. Gee, what for, Arnold? Well, e Eugene, it just might be better if I did it. There's a mailbox right by my house. Okay, then. I guess I'll see you Saturday. Bye, Eugene. Bye, Arnold. What a guy. Ow. As Arnold sprints home, he accidentally bumps into Harvey, the mailman, who's leaving Mr. Green's butcher shop, carrying a package suspiciously similar to Arnold's. The two drop their packages, not noticing when they accidentally swap packages. Arnold explains that he was just in a rush to mail something as he drops his stack of envelopes into the nearby mailbox and continues on his way. We fast forward to the day of Eugene's party as Arnold wakes up and calls Gerald. Hey Gerald, ready to go to Eugene's? Eugene's? Yeah, Eugene's. You know, his birthday party. What birthday party? You didn't get your invitation? But, but you'll still come, right? Oh, I can't. I, I gotta go to a bris. I'm sure everybody else is going. Relax, man. Hello? Sid? It's Arnold. Did you get an invitation to Eugene's party? Your cooking class? Okay, bye. Hello? Arnold then proceeds to call everyone from school to find out that nobody got their invitations, as we cut over to Harvey the mailman, who is eating a sandwich that has an invitation to Eugene's birthday party instead of lunch meat on it. Later, at Eugene's party, Arnold arrives to an excited Eugene who's celebrating by himself and is super happy to see Arnold. You're the first to arrive! Uh, some people aren't going to make it today, Eugene. Really? Who? Everybody. See, I called everyone about the party this morning, and no one got an invitation. I think it's kind of my fault. Oh, that's nonsense, Arnold. Somebody's bound to show up. Meanwhile, let's just enjoy the party. We could play musical chairs. <laughs> Hours later, Eugene and Arnold are each trying to finish entire cartons of ice cream before they melt, while Eugene's mom is vacuuming in the background. Arnold apologizes for ruining Eugene's birthday, and Eugene tells him not to apologize, saying that this was the greatest party ever. He keeps a very happy and optimistic mind as he says how happy he is that he got to spend the whole day with Arnold. He goes on to say that he even got two presents and that he must be the luckiest kid in the world. Later on, we see Arnold in a treehouse with Gerald, Sid, and Stinky. Why do you want to throw him another birthday party? You have got to stop trying to fix Eugene. He's the unluckiest kid in the world. Yeah, why bother, Arnold? He'd probably just jinx up that party too. Like the roof would cave in and crush everybody. Or the cake would probably explode or something. Eugene is an all-fired jinx after all. The brother's a jinx. Yeah, yeah. He's a walk look, you guys. It's just something I have to do, okay? He's my friend, and I can't let him down. Now help me think of a really good place for a party. They brainstorm ideas, and they end up settling on the aquarium. Arnold tasks Sid and Stinky with gathering all the kids and meeting them in the aquarium at 4 o'clock for Eugene's party. We then cut on over to the roller rink, where we see Sid and Stinky having a blast with all the other kids in class, talking about how good of an idea this was. Helga comes up asking where Eugene and Arnold are. That's when Sid and Stinky realize that they got it all mixed up. Meanwhile, at the aquarium... Hi Angel! Remember me? Your old pal Eugene! Woohoo! See Arnold? He waved at me! Uh, Eugene, I think I blew it again. What are you talking about, Arnold? Well, this was supposed to be a surprise party. Only no one showed up except for me and Gerald, and it's been hours. You were going to throw me a surprise party? Oh, that's so nice of you, Arnold. Eugene, don't you understand? No one showed up. This party is a total bust. Eugene very optimistically says that this party was even better than his first party because they got to hang out and look at all the fish while they waited for someone to show up this time. A security guard comes up and tells them to beat it because they close in five minutes. Eugene, I am so sorry. For what, Arnold? For everything. Every bad thing I've ever somehow done to you. You know, the goldfish I killed, the bike I wrecked, the paint, the glue, the crab, the car door, both birthday parties. 
I never stopped and counted. That is a lot of things, Arnold. So I'll throw a third foolproof birthday party for you. The best party ever in my backyard. Tomorrow, I'll invite everybody and I'll personally deliver the invitations to every single kid so nothing goes wrong, okay? Eugene takes a sec to think about it and he realizes that all of the bad things that happened occurred when Eugene was around Arnold. Eugene says that he came to the conclusion that Arnold is a jinx and that throwing him another party would be a bad idea because Arnold is the jinx. You think I'm a jinx? You shouldn't do what Arnold. I mean, what with you being a jinx and all. Look, Eugene, I'm not a jinx and I'm throwing you a birthday party whether you like it or not. In fact, it's going to be a surprise party. Gee, how can it be a surprise party? Look, you're going to show up and you're going to be surprised. Got it? It's going to be perfect and nothing is going to go wrong. Uh-huh, sure, Arnold. Sounds like a, a good plan. Well, I've got to go. Be careful on the way home. Later on, Arnold is telling Gerald about what happened and Gerald is cackling at the idea of Eugene calling Arnold a jinx. We fast forward to the next day in Arnold's backyard where all of the kids from school are awaiting Eugene's arrival. Arnold has the backyard jinx proof with bubble wrap, a first aid stand, and everything. Just when Helga starts to question whether or not Eugene will show up, it starts pouring down rain. Poor Arnold. It's raining on his party. It must be hard to be such a jinx. Arnold's surprise party, yeah, chocolate cake, yeah, big chocolate cake, yeah. Chocolate, you going? I don't know. I'm supposed to, I mean, the party's for me. But I just know something bad's gonna happen. I think maybe I should just go home. What do you think? I think it's a chocolate cake. Yeah, big chocolate cake. Yeah, chocolate. Hey, could I have one of those? No, I, uh, I need these. Back at the party, Stinky says maybe they should just call it off, but Arnold refuses. Meanwhile, Eugene's across the street debating on whether or not he should go, and he comes to the conclusion that Arnold is his friend and he has to go. Just then, as everyone's about to leave, Eugene bursts through the doors and the clouds clear and the sun lights up the party. Everything looks perfect. The sun is shining. All my friends are here. There's a beautiful birthday cake. And to top it off, we all chipped in and purchased you this brand new scooter. <gasps> a scooter? Oh, you shouldn't have. You guys are the greatest. See, Eugene, I told you this was going to be a perfect party. Nothing bad happened. Ah! Hey, 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 chocolate cake! After Eugene's accident, everyone leaves and we see the party in ruins. Grandma helps clean Eugene up and Arnold sits by sadly, saying that this is the third party that he messed up and that he's sorry. Eugene, ever the optimist, points out that this party was everything he wanted. He especially liked the part where he got completely washed out by the falling water. He sees it as a surprise that he never saw coming. You threw me a great birthday party, especially considering that, well, you're a jinx. <sighs> sure, Eugene. I'm the jinx, whatever you say. Well, I had a wonderful time. I'm gonna try out my new scooter right now! Whee! Great party, Arnold. I am not a jinx. Yeah, sure, buddy. Sure thing. Gerald? You're bugging me. Stop it. Look! I'm king of the world! <laughs> this episode is another one that really speaks volumes as to Eugene as a character. First of all though, I need to call out the oddball situation that led to no one getting their invitations. Arnold in such a rush crashes right into Harvey, who had just freshly picked up a whole lot of cold cuts. When they crash, they accidentally switch packages, but honestly, what are the odds of neither of them noticing? Like, the weight of freshly sliced deli meats and the weight of birthday invitations are noticeably different. Furthermore, why are Harvey's cold cuts packaged like that? Did Mr. Green put like individual slices of meat in their own envelopes? Regardless of the weird packaging and weight difference, what's done is done. Arnold put the cold cuts in the mailbox and Harvey takes the invitations home. We then fast forward to the day of the party and that's when Harvey finally makes a sandwich and uses a birthday invitation instead of meat, realizing that something was wrong. 
My question is though, why did it take so long for everyone to realize that there was a mix-up? You know good and well that Arnold didn't mail those invitations the day before the party. There's no way they would have been delivered in time, so it had to have been at least a few days in advance. In that time, I'd imagine that Harvey would have had a sandwich and realized that something wasn't right when he had no meat. Or maybe over those few days, Arnold could have asked some of his friends if they got their invitations, and when they say no, maybe he would realize that something wasn't right? Also, this is totally out of the blue and random, but why did Harvey put that invitation in his sandwich? The sandwich didn't put itself together, so if it wasn't Harvey, somebody did and just didn't notice that it was paper and not meat, I guess. Regardless of the weird timeline though, I just have to take a moment and say, what the hell? Literally, all of the worst things happen to Eugene, and it's so unfortunate because he's so nice and positive. I can't imagine him ever doing anything to spite anyone or doing anything wrong in general. We've seen Eugene go through some pretty messed up things so far, and he always just keeps the most positive mindset. Like, in this episode, we see his birthday party fail time and time again. At possibly the lowest point of the episode, we see Eugene and Arnold at Eugene's house being the only two that showed up for the party. To most, this would be a total bummer and kind of a spirit breaker. How does Eugene look at it though? He says that he must be the luckiest kid in the world because he got two presents and to hang out with Arnold all day. I can say this much, in the face of adversity, not only is Eugene resilient, but he's wholeheartedly positive which speaks volumes about his character. It seems as if no matter what's thrown at him, Eugene tends to always look at the glass half full and that's an admirable trait if you ask me. So many people would be fed up with life if put in Eugene's shoes think about it, bad things just seem to happen to him. He gets hurt a lot, things that he loves get hurt or break. More often than not, things just don't go his way. As a result of his seemingly bad luck, his social life has been more or less tarnished. Kids don't want to hang out with Eugene or even associate with him as a result of being branded a jinx. It's so bad that even when Arnold successfully planned a party, all of the kids were apprehensive to be there and they all left in a hurry right after Eugene showed up. Granted, it was mostly because they spent so long waiting for Eugene, but still, overall his entire situation is just sad and it seems like such a lonely existence. However, none of these negative things ever once stopped Arnold from trying to help. Even when things seemed absolutely hopeless, Arnold was always there to try and make things right for Eugene. He took the chance and rode the roller coaster with Eugene. He tried to remedy the issues he caused with Eugene's bike. He did his best to help Eugene find a new pet after Arnold murdered his goldfish. And of course, he made multiple attempts at throwing the perfect birthday for Eugene. All of these things may have not gone according to plan, and now that I put it into words like that, it kind of makes sense as to why Eugene would try to label Arnold as a jinx. But honestly, it's the thought that counts. Arnold may have caused Eugene strife on many numerous occasions, but in all reality, he had the best of intentions through it all, and deep down, Eugene definitely knows that. Moving on from there, we're going to check out some episodes that really exemplify our perceptions of Eugene as a character. First up, we're going to dive into the Season 3 episode called Grand Prix. This episode starts out at the local racetrack with Stinky and Sid admiring Arnold's go-kart that he made for the go-kart race. Now all we need to do is give her a name. It's on the other side, Stinky. See? The Dark Avenger. Cool. I love it. Hi, guys. Mm -hmm. Nice kart, Eugene. Thanks. I worked hard on it. All my life, I wanted a great go-kart. So I designed and built my own creation. I call it the Mauve Storm. <laughs> the Mauve Storm? Oh, please. Is this it? I just have to beat you losers? Just then, Wolfgang rolls up in a crazy-looking go-kart. He mocks the fourth graders, saying that he's going to destroy them. Well, well, well. So I'm racing the fourth graders today. <laughs> Morning, Wolfgang. Ready to rumble? In your dreams, Twiggy. You don't stand a chance in that purple little cream puff. Why don't you just go home now and cry in your bed? Well, some kids would do that, Wolfgang. Some kids would just give up and start falling apart piece by piece. But others come home from school and wash up and go racing in the streets. <laughs> We see the first race start as Helga, Wolfgang, Eugene, and Arnold go head to head. The race is cutthroat and we see all of the racers give it their best until this happens. Hi Arnold! Exhilarating, isn't it? Eugene, keep your eyes on the road! Ah! 
Wolfgang ends up taking first place, with Helga in second. In a shocking turn of events, turns out that all four cars qualified for the citywide finals, even the Mauve Storm and the Dark Avenger. That is, if their drivers can manage to fix their carts. Fix our carts? Look at them! My poor Mauve Storm, so young, cut down in the prime of life! <laughs> well, guess that's the end of your little go-karts. <laughs> Maybe not. What's that mean? Look, now we have two busted up go-karts, right? right? Right. But if we take parts from both of them, I bet we can make one really good go-kart. That plan really bites, Arnold. Arnold peps everyone up and tells them that with their combined resources, they can build a cart that'll beat Wolfgang. Eugene says that he still has his designs, leftover parts, and paint. Sid and Stinky agree to help, and we cut right over to Arnold's house where the kids are working on the cart. Now, let me get this straight. You're going to take two wrecked go-karts and put them together with some rusty screws and duct tape and somehow in less than a week build an amazing racer that'll win the Junior Grand Prix and defeat that big Wolfgang fella that's always giving you trouble. Is that right? That's right, Grandpa. What do you think? Oh, wonderful idea, short man. Go get him. You'll win for sure. Oh, look, a pig just flew by, and it's raining malted milk balls. We get a nice montage of Arnold and his friends trying to fix the go-kart while Eugene gets hurt and covers Stinky in oil in the process. Now all we need is some paint, some tires, a name, uh, guys, a little help, and a miracle. All finished. What do you think? I can't believe we let you talk us into painting it purple. It's not purple, Arnold. It's mauve. Whatever. We're still calling it the Dark Avenger. But Sid, look at it. It's the mauve storm. The Dark Avenger. The mauve storm. The Dark Avenger. As Eugene and Sid argue over the name, Stinky chimes in and suggests that they call it the Mauve Avenger, which sticks regardless of Arnold's lack of interest in the name. We fast forward to the day of the race, and we see Wolfgang antagonizing Arnold and Eugene. Everyone will fear the Mauve Avenger! The Mauve Avenger? Ha! I'm so scared! The big, powerful Mauve Avenger is gonna beat me! Not! You pathetic fourth grade losers are wasting your time! Laugh and agree! <laughs> I agree. Good series of insults, Wolfgang. Shut up. As the junior division finals prepare, we see all five racers approach the starting line. The light turns green and they're off at high speed. The race gets off to a cutthroat start and around lap four, we see people starting to take pit stops. Wolfgang takes his pit stop and makes a comment about how crazy it is out there. Hey Wolfgang, when do I get to drive? You get to drive? Never! <laughs> When geese fly out of my nose. I'm working, mommy. I'm getting... Helga, we all work together on this go kart to prepare for this race. We're a team. Okay, you want to lose? Here. Oh no, I, I couldn't possibly. You don't want to drive? Okay, fine. Out of my way. We see Arnold go in for his pit stop next, and this happens. Sid, take the wheel for a while. Uh, actually, it's my turn to drive. Uh, no. Uh, no way. Listen, guys, exactly half of the Mova Avenger is mine, so I get to drive at least half the race. Are you kidding? He'll crash for sure. Yeah, he's a jinx, and all five jinx. <laughs> Fellers, I think the whole thing's moot. We're dead meat. We see Eugene, Phoebe, and the other racers with laser focus as they speed for the finish. We see Eugene take first place, and immediately his tire comes off, and he ends up driving on axle, causing all of the other drivers, except for Phoebe, to crash. Miraculously, Eugene is still rolling and closing the gap between Phoebe, who's now taken first place. It's gonna be close! A photo finish! And the winner is... Helga's Angel! I'm okay. I told you you should have let me drive. Shut up. Well, you should have. I wouldn't have crashed. 
Well, we got second place. That's pretty good. Yeah, but we didn't win. But I, I didn't crash. But we didn't win. The episode ends as we see Harold and Helga walking by carrying their massive trophy, and Sid and Eugene are still arguing about whether the go-kart is named the Mole of Storm or the Dark Avenger. This is an episode that I always enjoyed as a kid, and it did a really interesting thing to my perception of Eugene as a character. Before we get into that though, we have to take a sec to unpack a few other things. First of all, I just want to talk about this scene. You don't stand a chance in that purple little cream puff. Purple little cream puff. Purple little cream puff. Purple little cream puff. Wolfgang is a massive jerk. He's probably one of the most notorious antagonists throughout this series. No matter the context of the episode that he appears in, he is always the bad guy or causing some sort of trouble. Fun fact though, the guy who voices Wolfgang is actually the original voice actor for Arnold from Season 1. What happened was, between recording the audio for Season 1 and Season 2, the creator of the show, Craig Bartlett, realized that the kid who had been voicing Arnold had his voice change and get deeper due to puberty, so he couldn't properly voice Arnold anymore. As a result, Wolfgang was created as a means to keep Arnold's old voice actor as part of the cast. Instead of playing our open-minded and calm protagonist, he transitioned to being an older antagonist and a bully, which I imagine was quite a change of pace, but I will say he does a great job at it. He truly made me hate Wolfgang, and this episode is a good example of how much of a jerk that Wolfgang can be. As it relates directly to Eugene though, we see Wolfgang being a jerk to him in the beginning, and Eugene just holds his chin up high and responds positively. I swear, Eugene doesn't have a mean bone in his body. In the face of a bully putting him down and saying that he's definitely going to lose, Eugene still maintains his happy outlook on life and holds on to hope that he'll win the race and qualify for the finals. One thing that did surprise me though was after Eugene and Arnold crash their go-karts, we see Arnold, Eugene, Stinky, and Sid team up to make a Franken-kart and join forces as a team. Honestly, this shocked me. So far, we've seen everyone except for Arnold do everything in their power to avoid Eugene at all costs. They've all labeled him as a jinx, and with that title comes everyone wanting to not even go near him in fear that bad things will happen to them. However, Sid and Stinky were game to have Eugene be part of their team for the go-kart race. In a way, this felt kind of out of character just on premise, but when we look at how they behave towards Eugene, it checks out and is consistent with their normal behaviors towards him. When they're in the final race, we see Arnold come in for a pit stop and Eugene requests that he get to drive given the fact that technically the cart is half his. Personally, I find that to be a reasonable request, but Sid and Stinky on the other hand try to immediately shoot down the idea due to them believing that Eugene is a jinx. They treat him like crap, and honestly, it drives me nuts a little bit. They're fully convinced that they're doomed just for the simple fact that Eugene is the one driving the car. Not gonna lie, the joy I felt when Eugene nearly won was just amazing. He was just a hair of a second away from first place, despite having lost a wheel. It really drove me nuts in the end, when Eugene is happy about getting that second place trophy and just taking a moment to enjoy the fact that they were that close to first. Sid and Stinky just have to rain on his parade and say that they still didn't win. It feels like they literally can't give Eugene even an inch. They just have to constantly tear him down, even in this moment when Eugene damn near won the race, they still can't help but be negative. Eugene getting second place, regardless of the circumstances, was a feat in and of its own. Let's be honest, Eugene doesn't have the best of luck, and we all know that, but even in a moment when he finally comes close to winning, Sid and Stinky can't even let him have that. It just makes me wonder, if he had one, what excuse would they pull out to drag him down then? You know they wouldn't just celebrate him and let him relish in the fact that he won, they would find something to bring up in an effort to drag him down. As a viewer, this episode definitely shined an interesting light on Eugene for me. Like, as you'd expect, Eugene stayed positive regardless of Wolfgang being a jerk, regardless of Sid and Stinky's opinions, and regardless of the fact that he got second place. However, this episode was proof that Eugene is capable regardless of bad luck. He can win. He can have moments of good luck, and this is a perfect example. Even though he lost a tire and their go-kart was destroyed, he nearly won, which, in my opinion, is a massive feat in and of its own. This episode made me realize that even though the writers of the show always go out of their way to portray Eugene as a total klutz and a jinx, he still has potential to do great things. Though the writers don't really allow that to happen all too often. Another thing that I can't help but bring up, and this is totally random, are these shots right here. 
It's just for a split second and only happens like two times, but we see the screen split in half where on the top of the screen is the shot of the racers driving, and on the bottom of the screen we see an over the top view of the entire racetrack as the racers proceed. This made my inner nostalgic gamer happy. This totally reminded me of Super Mario Kart for the Super Nintendo. If you've ever played that game, you'd recognize that shot being similar to the layout of the game where you see a behind view of your racer driving and below it is an over the top view of the map as each character races through it. Again, that's completely random and has nothing to do with Eugene or the topic at hand, but I just felt the need to bring it up. Moving on from there though, we're going to check out another episode that shines an interesting light on our understanding of Eugene, and that's going to be the season 5 episode, Stuck in a Tree. This episode starts out in the city park. We see a kite break free from its line and pass kids playing and people having a picnic, and it lands right in front of a tree where Arnold approaches it. Hi Arnold! Who's there? It's me, Eugene! Eugene, where are you? Up here, I'm in the tree! Hey! What are you doing up there? Just hanging around. <laughs> That's nice. Actually, I'm stuck. Stuck? Yup, stuck. <laughs> I got up this morning and thought, what a perfect day for climbing a tree. And it was, until I got up here and remembered, I have a tremendous fear of heights. I've been here for hours, just hoping someone might come by and help me. Arnold scales the tree to help Eugene get down, but right when he reaches the branch that Eugene is on, the one below that Arnold's standing on breaks and leaves Arnold stranded up there as well. Eugene says not to worry because he's sure someone will come by any minute now to save them, even though he had to wait for hours for Arnold to even show up. Yup, any minute now. Stupid boy, get out of my way! Hey Harold, up here! Huh? Well, what are you guys doing up in that tree? We're stuck. Stuck? <laughs> Arnold and Eugene stuck in a tree! S-T-U-K in a tree! <laughs> Harold laughs at them and calls them stupid for getting stuck in a tree. Arnold asks Harold to help them get down, and he makes them agree to each give him a nickel if he does. We then see Harold run off, and this happens. Yeah, I found this ladder leaning up against the water tower. There was a guy up there, but I didn't figure he'd mind if I borrowed it. You guys are so stupid! I ain't getting stuck in a tree! <laughs> It's okay, Harold. At least you try. Harold immediately panics and starts trying to brainstorm ideas of how to get down. Arnold says that they tried that, but all they can do is just wait for somebody to come by and help them. Another hour passes and Harold starts crying, saying that they're going to be stuck there forever and that he doesn't want to die. Just then, this happens. Hey, look! Someone's coming! Hey, up here! Mister, help you me, help. mister! Help. If we throw something, we can get his attention. Oh, that's a wonderful idea! After that happens, we see Chocolate Boy walk by. The boys wave him down, and they try to explain to him what he needs to do to help them. Go to the fire station. Tell them we're stuck in a tree, and we need help getting down. Tell them Eugene sent you. They know me. They've rescued me many times before. Go directly to the fire station. Tell them we're stuck in a tree, and whatever you do, don't stop for chocolate. Got it. Go to the fire station. Tell them we're stuck in a tree. Don't stop mm. except for chocolate. No. Go to the fire station. Tell them we're stuck in a tree, and don't stop for chocolate. Go to the tree. Tell them we're stuck in the fire station, and don't stop except for chocolate. No. Listen carefully and repeat after me. Chocolate Boy walks away, repeatedly saying that he's stuck in the fire station, go to the tree, and stop for chocolate. Harold and Arnold immediately just lose hope, completely confident that Chocolate Boy isn't coming back. Eugene, on the other hand, says that he's sure Chocolate Boy is going to come back riding on a fire engine with a bunch of firemen who will save them. We see time start passing as the boys just sit there and wait. About another hour passes by and Harold realizes that he's hungry. Thankfully, he has four pounds of leftover egg foo young in his backpack, which he pulls out and offers to share. What, what, what are you doing? Don't give it to him, he'll drop it, he's a jinx! Oh, don't worry, I'll be very careful. <laughs> don't worry, guys, I just know Chocolate Boy's on his way here with the fire trucks to save us. Sometime later, Harold starts freaking out. 
Arnold tells him to take it easy, but that just seems to make things worse. He's convinced that he's gonna live in the tree for the rest of his life. I'm gonna end up living in this stupid tree with you two, eating tree worms and bark, picking splinters out of my butt every night. I'm never gonna grow up or go to college or get married. I mean, who am I gonna marry, that squirrel? Arnold tells Harold that they're gonna get out of there, but Harold counters, saying what if they don't, which leads to Arnold having a daydream of the future. We see flying cars and floating conveyor belt sidewalks surrounding the three boys who are still living in the tree. Eugene says that today's the day they celebrate their 70th anniversary of being in the tree, and that any minute now, Chocolate Boy will be back with the firemen. What are you talking about? It's been 70 years, he's not coming back! I told you, I can't clean out the bird nest tonight, I'm playing poker with the boys. Oh, nag, 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 that's all you do. Take my advice, don't get married. Especially to a squirrel. Hey look, there goes the gang. Too bad they're all deaf, otherwise they could hear us and go get help. Gosh, you'd think eventually he'd run out of gas! Back in real time, we see Harold crying his eyes out while Eugene is trying to console him, telling him that life in the tree won't be that bad, to which Harold responds by threatening to pound him. We fast forward and the skies turn gloomy and it looks like it's about to start storming. Stop hiccuping, please! Stop hiccuping! I can't take the hiccuping! Ah! I stopped! Ah, I'm trapped! I'm trapped in hungry and- A little scared? No, I'm not scared! You're gonna be fine. You just have to have a little faith that everything will work out. Look at Eugene. He's looking on the bright side. I know, Arnold. But that's because he's living in his own little pretend land! Right as Arnold says that, it starts pouring as lightning strikes. Eugene starts singing a song to try to calm Harold down, which just makes Harold freak out even more. Harold threatens to beat up Eugene, but Arnold sits in his way. Uh, stop it! Stop it! Stop singing that idiot a song! Down, uh, and that's there's it! That's it. Harold, seriously, someone's going to get hurt. So Eugene, I'm gonna break your face! Cut it out, both of you! It's a life saving. You ask for you little life Harold, stop! What? Harold struggles just to simply hold on to Arnold, and Eugene tells him that he needs to believe that he can lift up Arnold if they're going to be able to save him. Eugene starts singing a motivational song to help Harold get the strength to hold on. Harold starts singing along with him, and as they sing, the rain stops and the clouds part as the sun comes out again. Just then, the fire engine pulls up with Chocolate Boy in the front seat. I knew everything would turn out alright! Chocolate Boy came with the fireman, and we're safely in the cherry picker! Here we go! First we're stuck in a cherry tree, now we're stuck in a cherry picker! Isn't life funny? Oh, you see, I'm gonna pound you! Harold. There's a lot to love about this episode, but we gotta unpack a few things here. I just have two words. Chocolate boy. I don't want to go too in-depth with him, considering that I plan to cover him in part of a future episode, but like, how messed up is it that this kid literally can't even remember what he was supposed to do because he's so addicted to chocolate? Let's get past that though. This episode is definitely one that stuck with me as a kid. Honestly, seeing Eugene's mindset and his outlook on life is something that has really had an effect on my life over the years. When life gives me lemons, or things get hard in life, I try my best to adopt a Eugene-esque mindset. This episode got pretty dark though. As these poor kids are stuck in a tree, literally no one notices. Granted that, according to Harold, they're in a part of the park that no one ever goes to, but still. The struggle they had to go through to get help was just kind of insane. These poor kids had to endure a whole thunderstorm while up in that tree, not to mention Harold literally trying to beat the hell out of Eugene while up in the tree over the simple fact that he was being positive. Personally, I feel like Eugene being positive was completely necessary given the circumstances. If all three of them were all doom and gloom, that just makes for a situation that probably won't end well, but Eugene staying positive had a good effect on the outcome of the situation if you ask me. Without a doubt, the episode reached its darkest when Arnold ended up dangling from the tree with nothing but the combined strength of Harold and Eugene keeping him alive. A fall from that height directly onto his head definitely would have had the potential to be life-threatening or potentially life-changing if he did survive the fall. 
Sometimes it blows my mind that the writers of the show would put these literal children in some of the scenarios that they did. Hey Arnold really just wasn't afraid to go there, and when Eugene is involved, it seems more often than not that someone's going to end up in a life-threatening situation. More than anything, this episode acts as a great example of how others tend to respond to his attitude and positivity. Eugene just being his normal, positive self almost got him beaten up by Harold who just couldn't stomach the positivity. And like, I would get it a little more if Eugene was displaying, like, toxic positivity, but in this specific scenario, he was literally just trying to look at the glass half full and to have hope that they would get saved. It got really close to toxic positivity when Eugene started talking about the bright sides of living in the tree for the rest of their lives, but on the whole, it was mostly just positive hopefulness that they would be rescued. Overall though, this might be one of my favorite Eugene episodes. This is one that really stuck with me as a kid. I absolutely adored that part where Arnold daydreams of their future living in the tree. The way Arnold imagines the future is just hilarious and I love it. Moving on from there, we're going to check out the season 5 episode, Eugene Eugene. This episode starts out with everyone outside of school looking at a sign that was put up about auditions for a play called Eugene Eugene that the school is putting on. What the heck's Eugene Eugene? Eugene. It's a wonderful musical Broadway play about a hero named Eugene who's kind of a loser but also plucky and positive and extremely lovable who triumphs over misfortune. Oh, that's my favorite musical ever. And I've always wanted to play the part of Betty, Eugene's oh so complicated love interest. Yeah, Eugene tries to win her away from the bad guy Lawrence. At first, Betty's torn between the two suitors, but in the end, she falls for Eugene. Eugene excitedly explains how the show ends with the main character singing his happy song called Keep Your Sunny Side Up and we cut right on over to auditions. Stella! <laughs> that will be quite enough. I consign you to the chorus. Next! But Red, whatever will become of me? Frankly, my dear, I don't give a hoot. Next! It's not easy being perfect. It's not easy being sweet. Milk and princess, you're breaking my heart. Oh, she's perfect, all right. Stinky is in the audience fawning over Lila, and the director is nearly brought to tears by her performance. We see Eugene come up next and sing a number. When life gives you lemons, dance. Dance like there's a muskrat in your pants. When your toes are tapping, nothing bad can happen. When life gives you lemons, dance. I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was more than okay. That was inspired. We then see the director in front of everyone announcing who was picked to be in the play. He says Eugene is playing the role of Eugene, Lila will be playing Betty, and the role of the antagonist, Lawrence, will be played by none other than Arnold. Me? Is Lawrence the black-hearted villain? It's a juicy role, Arnold. Well, I'm gonna run home and reread the whole play, even if it takes me all night. <laughs> oh, I love that scene. <gasps> Wait a minute. This isn't what happens next. Eugene, what? Betty? Lawrence? Nice guys finish last. Arnold, did you read the play? Eugene doesn't get the girl, Arnold. He gets hit by a trolley on page 78. Eugene and Arnold are blown away by the fact that the show has been completely rewritten and it finishes with the bad guy singing a song about how nice guys finish last. They go to the theater director's office to confront him about the change in the script. I rewrote the play for today's disenfranchised modern audience. In real life, the loser never gets the girl because, because the girl always turns out to be a scheming, duplicitous harpy who tears your heart out, still beating, and... <gasps> Trust me, it's a much better ending. But now there's no redemption for the hero. He gets hit by a trolley. And I don't know about ending the play with a song like Nice Guys Finish Last. It's a really depressing message. The director brushes them off and excuses the negative ending as black comedy. He's confident that the audience will love it. Eugene just goes along with it and accepts. Meanwhile, Arnold tries to argue, but the director basically tells him that they can't do anything about it as he dismisses them from his office. Oh, if only the hero had gotten his dream. His Betty. My Betty. But alas, he did not. 
Let's just hope for the best and try and look on the bright side. After all, things still get to be happy and optimistic for the first 77 pages. You mean before Betty dumps you for me and you get hit by the trolley? As they walk by, Eugene remarks about how it's going to be Arnold dancing with Betty in the end, which very abruptly catches Helga's attention. We fast forward two weeks ahead to the day before the premiere show as the kids are rehearsing. I just can't be with you. Because she's with me. Now for the last time, get lost. <sighs> oh well, I guess I have no choice but to give up and leave town. Perfect! Just like real life. Ow. Well, I guess it's true what they say, Betty. Nice guys finish last. Bad guys have a blast. Take his money. Grab his honey. As Arnold attempts to sing the final song, the director interrupts him angrily, telling him that he needs to be meaner and nastier, as the director sings a portion of the song to show him how it's done. After he finishes, the director tells him to go home and take some time to focus for the big premiere tomorrow. We then see Eugene sitting by himself at the piano. So keep your chin in the air, a spring in your step, keep a walking with flair. Chock full of pep. Arnold walks up out of nowhere, saying that there's something he needs to tell Eugene. I'm quitting the play. Quitting the play? But we open tomorrow night. I can't go through with it. I can't go up there and watch you get hit by that trolley again. But Arnold, what about the first 77 pages? They're really great. I know, but it's the ending that really counts. I thought I'd get used to Mr. Lightlighter's rewrite, but the truth is, it's just too mean. You're right, Arnold. You're absolutely right. I should be ashamed of myself for ever agreeing to go along with it in the first place. You were just being optimistic. It's exactly what Eugene Eugene would have done. Eugene? Eugene says he wishes there was a way to fix the play, but it's just too late. Just then, he gets an idea, and we immediately cut to the night of the premiere as the director introduces the play. Good evening, welcome all to my adaptation of the award-winning musical, Eugene, Eugene. I think you'll find it enjoyable, and perhaps even painfully truthful. <laughs> oh, Betty, if only you knew how painful. The play starts, and all of the kids are singing a song about Eugene. Meanwhile, Helga is up in the rafters, rigging up a bucket of red paint, saying that she plans to dump it on Arnold and Lila during their big scene together. The play continues on, seemingly without a hitch. Oh, Eugene, let me help you. How many times have I told you, Betty? There's no helping a loser like Eugene. Well, you know what they say. When life gives you lemons, dance. Dance like there's a muskrat in your pants. When you're caught in a downpour with nothing to live for, strike your most spirited stance. And dance, dance, dance. <gasps> I'm okay! After that number, Eugene runs backstage and approaches Arnold, saying that this is it, the moment of truth. Lila comes up and asks what's going on, and Arnold just tells her, you'll see, and whatever happens out there, just go along with it. We see the play continue from the scene where Eugene is supposed to get hit by the trolley. Oh well, I guess I have no choice but to give up and leave town. <gasps> What's going on? Didn't you read the headlines? Oh, Eugene, I finally realized that Lawrence is pushy and cruel. It's you that I love, you and only you. Curses! Foiled again! The brat has restored the original ending! As that's happening, Helga realizes that Arnold isn't gonna get the girl, so she rushes to stop the paint bucket from falling, but she trips over a rope and as a result, the bucket of paint falls on her instead. Eugene breaks out into the final song that was intended to originally be a part of the play. Keep your chin in the air, a spring in your step, keep a walking with flair, chomp full of pep, despite all the odds, just pop on those clogs, keep your sunny side up. The song finishes, and we see the director impressed and clapping for their performance. Just then, Betty, the woman that the director has been crying over, shows up, telling him that he's the one that she really loves, and the two embrace each other. 
I'm not gonna lie to you guys, I completely forgot that this episode existed, but when I started watching it, everything came back to me. This episode is a really interesting one, and it gets dark for many different reasons. First of all, how messed up is it that the director just blatantly uses these kids as a vessel to take out his relationship problems? Like, I have no idea what happened between the director and his love interest, but it's clear that it affected him deeply, and that sucks. I feel bad for him in that regard, but taking out those feelings on anyone is just uncalled for, especially taking it out on innocent kids. Eugene in particular was just exuberant about the play as someone who's familiar with the original work. However, the director stripped Eugene of all his excitement due to the fact that he felt the need to rewrite the script to reflect the negativity that he had experienced in his own personal life. It was just really sad seeing Eugene go from hyped and super excited about this play to just heartbroken over the fact that partway into the play, it was distorted into this big nasty climax where the antagonist prevails. It hit me especially hard during that scene where Eugene's sitting at the piano just mourning the loss of what the play was originally intended to be. Arnold tries to do the right thing by saying that he's gonna step down from his role because it just doesn't feel right. Arnold, with his highly in tune moral compass, just couldn't stomach the idea of having to be mean to Eugene and having to see him get hit by a trolley. Meanwhile, Eugene just feels ashamed of himself for being willing to participate in this play in the first place. It put a bad taste in my mouth seeing two good people like Arnold and Eugene being seemingly forced to go against everything they stand for morally at the bidding of a bitter director who's holding onto the grudge of a previous relationship. This episode acts as a good reminder to keep yourself in check when you're going through something, don't get me wrong, it's okay to have feelings, it's okay to cry it's okay to be upset. But what's not okay is taking it out on people who had nothing to do with anything you went through. Nobody should ever have to endure that, especially not kids who are just trying to learn from their teacher. One thing I want to bring up in regards to this episode is how they didn't really lean into the jinx thing too hard with it. Usually it's constant people putting Eugene down for being a jinx or just bad things constantly happening to him for no rhyme or reason. It was kind of nice to have that not be the forefront of this episode. Like sure, there was a few random gags like Eugene falling off the stage, but on that same note, he's playing a character that's a happy-go-lucky guy who just so happens to have bad luck, so it's fitting that he would fall off stage. For the most part though, it felt like all the bad things that happened to Eugene in this episode had someone to blame for it. The play getting rewritten because of the bitter director was a good example. That wasn't something that just happened because of Eugene's luck. That was a result of a spiteful director, but also that ending serves as another great example. We see the entire stage destroyed as Eugene falls, but he didn't trip out of bad luck or fall on his own accord. He fell as a result of people dropping him, which is ultimately out of his control. The stage being destroyed was a domino effect that was caused by the tipping point of people dropping Eugene, so ultimately that's another thing that wasn't necessarily his fault, and he more or less was a casualty to the situation. Moving on from that topic, we're going to dive into a more broad topic, and this is essentially going to be a few episodes where general bad things have happened to Eugene, or situations where he was just truly done dirty by someone with bad intentions. Starting off, we're going to check out the Season 1 episode, False Alarm. This episode begins at school, with kids wandering the halls, when out of nowhere, someone pulls the fire alarm. <laughs> It's a false alarm! Wait till I get my hands on the kid who pulled that alarm. We fast forward to all the kids gathering in the cafeteria for what seems to be a mock trial deciding whether or not Eugene is guilty. Eugene Arwitz? You have been caught red-handed in the pulling of the fire alarm. A most serious offense. But I didn't do it! <laughs> what my client is trying to say is, he didn't do it, Yana. Principal Wartz cites the school's bylaws by saying that a student can't be expelled unless a jury of their peers decides whether the student is guilty or not. 
At the same time, we see the jury full of kids all busting up laughing at Eugene. Stinky, acting as Eugene's lawyer, whispers to him that he needs to face the fact that he's gonna fry. To which Eugene says that he didn't do it, but the jury laughs even harder at him for proclaiming that he's innocent. We cut over to the jury meeting as Helga is reviewing the votes. Fudgy nut nut bar? It's on the back, madam. Fortress mommy. Oh. Guilty and not guilty? Come not on, get guilty? this stuff out of the All way. All right, who's the bonehead? Helga, our votes are supposed to be secret. Yeah, right, Phoebe. Quit kidding around and change your vote so we can get out of here. I've got tickets to WrestleMania. Ah, you better smear the fire alarm. Phoebe didn't vote not guilty. I did. Arnold explains that he thinks there's reasonable doubt that Eugene pulled the fire alarm. Arnold asks them what's more important, their petty little pleasures or making sure that their classmate gets a fair trial, to which all of them rudely proclaim that their petty pleasures are far more important. Arnold insists that they go through the evidence again. Anyways, according to the testification of Squeaky Peterson, just before the fire alarm was pulled, she observified Eugene walking right by the fire alarm. It was at that moment that someone Unknown as to the rest of us, but definitely not me, you guys. Pulled Squeaky's right pigtail hard, detracting her. While as Squeaky was detracted, someone pulled the fire alarm. And who was right there? Helga explains that what Harold is trying to say is that Eugene had the opportunity to do it, to which Arnold argues that lots of other kids were also there and had the opportunity. Helga brings up the peanut butter that was on the fire alarm, but Arnold says that peanut butter means nothing. Um, in addition to the peanut butter evidence, a pair of eyeglasses were found a few feet from the scene of the crime. A few minutes after the fire alarm, the students were allowed to re-enter the building. It was at this point the eyeglasses in question were discovered by our classmate, Sid. Hey! These appear to be Eugene's. Look, everybody, Eugene's glasses! Boy, howdy, Eugene is gonna fry. Hmm. These are Eugene's glasses. Huh. Phoebe continues to explain, but Helga cuts her off, telling her to get to the footprints. Footprints were found leading up to the fire alarm and then into a nearby broom closet. They were of the same size and unusual make of Eugene's distinctive sandals. And finally, a pencil stub with the word Winky Man was found outside the broom closet. Hmm. Oh, this wanky land. Therefore, in conclusion, it appears that Eugene is as guilty as sin. Helga tries to tell Arnold that the facts are all there and questions what more evidence he would need. Gerald agrees, explaining that Eugene was found in the broom closet, which Helga interjects, saying that signifies Eugene attempting to flee from the scene of the crime. Helga, baby, put your feet up. I'll tell it. <clears throat> no. I think he admitted the above mentioned heinous crime. <laughs> Eugene must have figured that he could find the broom closet so all the kids ran past. But he accidentally locked himself in. Hello? Could someone please let me out? And that's where the principal found him, about a minute later. Arnold says that means nothing because they found Eugene locked in closets multiple times. He begins to explain his reasonable doubt. Okay, here's my version. Maybe when he was eating lunch, someone distracted him from his peanut butter sandwich. Hey, Melvin! Who? Me? Later, when Eugene was going to class, he could have tripped, just like he does every day for one reason or another. I'm fine. Here, I'll help you. Ah, oh, thanks. No problem. Arnold says that there's one piece of evidence that certainly can't be traced back to Eugene, and that's none other than the Wanky Land pencil that was found on the scene. Everyone knows Eugene. He's been in more accidents this year alone than all of us combined. And everyone knows that Eugene was banned last fall from Wanky Land when he tripped off the bandstand and caused the whole Thanksgiving Day Parade to crash. Anyway, even though he loves Wanky Land, it's not likely that he'd have one of their pencils, since he hasn't been near there since. <laughs> Arnold claims that someone framed Eugene and planted the evidence. Someone who hates Eugene and has reason to harm him. Someone? 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 Okay, okay, I did it! I confess! I planted the peanut butter. I made the shoe prints. I left the glasses at the scene of a crime. But why, Curly? 
because three months, two weeks, and four days ago, Eugene borrowed my favorite pencil, the pencil I got last summer at Winky Land. And then when he finally returned it, it had chew marks all over it, and he sharpened it down to the metal part. Curly explains that all he could think about was Eugene writing with his pencil, biting the eraser, and sharpening it over and over again. And then when he gave it back, he just said, here you go. Like, it was no big deal, so Curly hatched a plot to frame Eugene. Bingo! He'd be branded for life! <laughs> we cut back to the courtroom where Principal Wartz announces that Eugene is innocent and everyone cheers, contradictive to the laughter that they were spewing at him when he was claiming how innocent he was. So you admit you pulled the fire alarm. <laughs> That's right! Hi, did it! I pulled the fire alarm! And I do it again, too! See? <laughs> this episode hits a little different for a few reasons. I definitely have to point out the art style and animation of season one. After looking back at all these episodes from later seasons, this one just feels so interesting. It's like looking back at season 1 of Spongebob after watching episodes from later seasons. The older, hand-drawn style is just so eye-catching and it feels so nostalgic to me. Right out of the gate, I have to point out the utter chaos that was the fire alarm being pulled. When I was a kid in school, whenever the fire alarm went off, there was always some sense of order. Sure, people would rush to get out of the school and it could tend to be a bit of a stampede, but once everyone was outside, there would be some sort of organization. At minimum, we at least had a place for everyone to gather together. However, apparently at PS 118 when the fire alarm goes off, everyone just goes outside and sprints away from the school in whatever direction they can. Principal Wartz's effort at stopping them from fleeing was just so mediocre at best. Speak of the devil, I gotta say, Principal Wartz's mannerisms in Season 1 were just so weird. If you compare this Principal Wartz to the one seen in later seasons and episodes that we've covered, this one just feels a lot more clunky and awkward. The way he stomps up to the fire alarm and straight up tastes the mysterious brown goop on it had me cackling and gagging at the same time. Moving on from there though, this mock trial was just a little completely obnoxiously ridiculous. Nobody was taking this seriously except for Eugene and Principal Wartz. The power imbalance in the situation was laughable considering that Wartz basically has the last say as the principal and adult in the situation, meanwhile Eugene was just a kid who had seemingly no one on his side, considering his lawyer was ready to give up and the entire jury was just laughing at him. Which that in and of itself is a problem. What kind of trial blatantly just allows the jurors to be biased and ridicule and laugh at the defendant? Okay, I get that it's not a real trial and that it's just an elementary school mock trial, but seriously, the fact that Eugene seemed doomed from the start was just kind of gross. Thankfully, Arnold was basically the only other person in the room who took this seriously and saw Eugene for who he truly is. Like, sure, I'd understand all of the kids finding him guilty if Eugene had some sort of history of pulling fire alarms or doing anything with ill intent in general, but that's just not Eugene. You know that, I know that, and of course Arnold knows that. I've never once seen Eugene do anything malicious whatsoever, at least up to this point in the series. It's pretty ridiculous that they would think he's guilty. On top of that, the basis of expulsion and the trial is that Eugene pulled the fire alarm out of spite or malice. However, even if he did accidentally trip, fall, and pull the fire alarm on his way down, it would be extremely draconian for him to be expelled over an incident like that. I also have to bring up Curly. What the hell is this kid's problem? If you saw my first episode in the Dark Side of Harnold, you might recall the episode where Curly snaps and they basically mimic a school shooter scenario with him throwing dodgeballs and barricading himself in the principal's office. This is yet again another episode where Curly snaps and does some unhinged out of pocket shit. Curly is just one of those people that you definitely need to keep an eye on because he's very apt to do some crazy shit just for you looking at him the wrong way. I will admit though, his voice actor does a great job. He portrays someone snapping and losing their shit pretty well. I was convinced, that's for sure. Overall, the entire premise of this episode was just screwed up. More or less, it just felt like everyone was against Eugene because they don't like him, and they all don't like him because he was branded a jinx. 
Literally, him being branded a jinx almost got him expelled from school over something that he didn't even do. Simply due to the fact of how all of his peers perceive him, save for Arnold, who's just an absolute saint. I'm still just mind blown about the idea of your expulsion being dependent upon a mock trial. Like, in all reality, it's just a popularity contest. Like, if everybody likes you, they will say you are not guilty and then you won't be expelled. But, of course, everybody labeled Eugene as a jinx, so they're all naturally just gonna say he's guilty. On a more lighthearted note though, we have to talk about Squeaky Peterson. Squeaky is an interesting character to me. This is the one and only episode that she appears in and she doesn't have any lines. She just appears in this flashback. We can assume that she's probably related to Stinky considering that they share the same last name and look pretty similar to one another. I find it rather mysterious though. We have literally nothing on Squeaky other than the assumption that she's related to Stinky. We don't know if she has any friends or what grade she's in and on top of that she would never be seen again outside of this episode. It's obvious that she was just a throwaway character and only there for the gag more or less but I can't help but wonder if at any point they had plans for the character. They could have put literally anyone else there in that place, be it an established character or just a random character that has no background or story, but oddly enough they chose a probable relative of Stinky. It makes me extra curious considering that we've also had multiple episodes where we dive into Stinky's family life a bit, so I feel like that's a bit of a missed opportunity for them to unpack Squeaky as a character, just a bit, but regardless, I just felt the need to bring her up. Next up, we're going to tackle another really interesting episode. It doesn't necessarily revolve around Eugene completely, but there's some good Eugene context here for us to digest. We're checking out the Season 4 episode, Deconstructing Arnold. This episode starts out with Arnold waiting for the bus outside of his house. He gets on the bus and meets all of his friends. Hey guys, what's going on? Pipe down, Arnaldo! Can't you see we're trying to listen here? Uh, hello? Yeah, um, I was just wondering, is your refrigerator running? It is? <laughs> then you better go catch it. <laughs> oh! Cut it out, Curly. Cool phone, Sid. Is it new? New? Uh, sort of. I borrowed it from Lorenzo. That was awfully nice of him. Yeah. Plus, what he doesn't know won't hurt him. Arnold starts to question Sid's morals due to the fact that he took Lorenzo's cell phone without asking. Helga calls him a wet blanket as she snatches the phone from Sid in order to make the next prank call. We cut over to the school where we see all of the kids sitting around Rhonda as she writes a note. Dear Curly, I've been admiring you from afar for quite some time. And even though I'm too shy to tell you how I feel in person, I just had to write you and say that frankly, Curly, with your bold eyewear, jaunty upper lip, and attractive bowl cut hairdo, I think you're a total hottie. Sincerely yours, your secret admirer. <laughs> Yet again, Arnold brings morals into the question. This time, Rhonda's morals. She explains that she's tired of Curly being obsessed with her, so she thinks that if she writes him an anonymous secret admirer letter, then maybe he'll forget about her in pursuit of his new secret admirer. Yet again, Helga criticizes him for being a spoil sport. We cut over to Arnold approaching the other kids, asking if they want to play some baseball with him and Gerald. Harold and I are planning a little monkey shine for Eugene. Yeah, when Eugene gets on his bike for his afternoon ride, it'll be all wobbly and break apart and it'll fall right mm, off. That's a really bad idea. It'll be a hoot. Yeah, Mr. Goody Two Shoes. How about you stop being such a party pooper for once in your life? Really, Arnold, you are quite the busy one. Yeah, mind. you're a regular nosy Parker. When it comes to meddling, you're the king. And you're a kibitzer, too. What the heck's a kibitzer? It's Yiddish for Big Fat Budinsky. Helga tells Arnold that she doesn't even think that he could go a whole day without sticking his nose in someone else's business. Sid agrees, and just like that, Arnold agrees too. He says that if that's how they really feel, then he'll just stop giving people advice. No big deal. All the kids are relieved that Arnold will be keeping to himself, and we cut over to the park where Gerald and Arnold are hanging out. Do you think what the other kids are saying about me is true? I mean, do you really think I'm always going around butting into other people's business? You? Are you kidding? Of course not. I mean, that's crazy. It's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Gerald. Sorry, man. I mean, truth is, you are kind of a Badinsky. And that settles it. As of right now, I'm never giving advice to anyone ever again. You never give advice again. I'll believe it when I see it. 
We cut back over to the school where Stinky and Harold just finished messing up Eugene's bike. Eugene walks up and he gets on his bike and this happens. Hey, my bike feels kind of funny. That's about the point where the dominoes start falling. Eugene got hurt, just like Arnold said he would. Back in class, Curly is reading the note that Rhonda wrote anonymously. He glances over to Rhonda and notices her writing with a pen that has identical ink to the writing on the note that he got, and he immediately connects the dots, just like Arnold said he would. We then cut over to Sid, who's still walking around with Lorenzo's cell phone as he prank calls a bunch of pizzas to be delivered to the school cafeteria. Some kid throws a paper airplane and it hits Sid in the face, causing him to drop the cell phone as it shatters on the ground. He then approaches Arnold at the drinking fountain. See, I've got this problem. Look, Sid, I'm sorry. Oh, but... Arnold, I am so glad I found you. You have just got to help me. Hey, Arnold, Harold and me is in a manure load of trouble. And we need you to get us out of it. Look, you guys, I'm sorry you're having problems, but I can't help you. What do you mean you can't help? Yeah, you're always giving advice. And figuring out what we should do in moments of crisis. Yeah, well... That was before this morning, when you all agreed that it was a busybody and told me to keep my nose out of your business. Arnold says that they told him to stay out of things, and that's what he's gonna do, so they're all on their own. The group of kids angrily approaches Helga, saying that this is all her fault because it was her idea to tell Arnold off in the first place. Helga says that they don't need Arnold to tell them what to do, and she says that she can give advice just as good as he can. You stole Lorenzo's phone and broke it, eh? Okay, all you gotta do is put it back in his locker before he comes back from vacation. He'll never even know it was you. Next! Look, Princess, if you want Curly off your back once and for all, just let him keep on thinking you're his secret admirer. You know, tell him that you're really, really wild about him. Trust me, once you put him on the spot, he'll be totally repulsed. Repulsed? Got it. Alright, boys, here's the plan. You blame the entire Eugene incident on some other stooge before he finds out that you dolts are the ones who tampered with his bike and finally snaps. Believe me, it's the right thing to do. We fast forward a bit, and we see the kids taking Helga's advice. Rhonda approaches Curly and tells him about how in love she is with him, and as you'd expect, Curly is ecstatic and he ends up planting one on her. Meanwhile, Sid is attempting to break into Lorenzo's locker right when Lorenzo walks up and catches him red-handed. Then we see Harold and Sid talking about who they're gonna blame. Hi guys! Hey, how are you feeling? Oh, I'm just fine. In fact, the doctors say I should have the feeling back in my legs in just a couple of weeks. Um, Eugene, Harold and I know who the shifty feller was that tinkered with your back. You do? We sure do. It was... It was Harold's Stinky! fault! It no, was, it was him! It was all he did it. Hey, what in the heck are you blaming me for? The whole bike prank was your dumb idea! It was not! What in the midst of them fighting, Eugene gets pushed away and ends up rolling down the stairs nearby, causing him even further injury. Arnold sees what happened and contemplates helping them out, but Gerald tells him to remember what Helga said and that he shouldn't interfere with their lives. Because that's exactly what they asked for. Helga overhears the interaction and she ends up pulling out her Arnold locket and belting out a soliloquy about how she's done wrong to her beloved Arnold and she walks down the stairs as she keeps talking, walking past Eugene's crashed wheelchair and all of his bandages strewn all over the place. When I get my hands on that Helga, she's gonna be sorry she was ever born. Yeah, that Helga's advice really bites. Why did I even listen to her? If she wasn't a girl, I'd pound uh, her. Guys, <laughs> let me smell it. Let me smell your hair. Uh, get away from me, you four-eyed freak. Please, just one little whiff. That's all I need. We cut over to Helga and Arnold in a broom closet as Helga is basically begging Arnold to start giving people advice again. She admits that she has literally no moral compass and should be the last one giving advice, and that all of Arnold's friends are in a mess without his guidance. We cut over to the front of the school where Arnold is addressing all of his peers in need of advice. Alright you guys, listen up. Rhonda, tell Curly you're sorry for making him think you were his secret admirer. No problem. Sid, you can start by apologizing to Lorenzo for stealing his phone. Okay. Stinky and Harold, the first thing you need to do is ask Eugene to forgive you. That is, if he can even hear you. I'm okay. 
As Arnold is finishing giving everyone advice, the episode comes to an end with Helga gazing longingly into her locket. Like I said, this episode didn't necessarily revolve around Eugene per se, but not only was he done dirty in an extreme way that took a dark twist, but also shined an interesting light on our perception of him as a character, yet again. This episode is another one that definitely went there. It tackled themes of bullying, stealing, shaming, but all in a way that led to a good moral of the story. There's a few things I need to unpack, and I'm going to start with something simple and straightforward. What the hell is Curly's problem? In the last episode we checked out, we saw him basically being unhinged and acting like a psychopath over a pencil, and now we see him basically being a creepy stalker predator. He even goes as far as asking Rhonda just for a whiff of her hair. Not to mention him kissing her without her enthusiastic consent. Granted, she did say that she liked him, which might lead to him believing that it's okay, but like, it just feels extremely inappropriate to grab someone like that and pretty much forcibly plant one on them like he did. Even if that person does like you, consent is important and they should definitely be in a position where they're expecting something like that to happen, not just forced into it the way Curly forced Rhonda. Getting back on track though, as far as Eugene is concerned, this episode was gnarly. When Harold and Stinky were messing with Eugene's bike in an effort to make him have an accident, I just couldn't help but roll my eyes. According to them, Eugene is a jinx, so I figured they would assume Eugene is just going to have an accident regardless of their tampering. The show's writers make it seem like Eugene often faces danger regardless of what he's doing, so them messing with his bike probably wasn't all too necessary, as the likelihood of him getting hurt regardless was pretty high. However, them doing what they did made his accident substantially worse than it probably would have been if they didn't tamper with his bike. Eugene ended up being hurled into traffic and nearly got hit and potentially killed by multiple cars that were passing through the street outside of the school. Furthermore, he crashed through a fence and got straight up mauled by dogs so bad that he literally ended up not having any feeling in his legs anymore and was left in a wheelchair. Then, when Eugene ended up getting pushed down the stairs by Harold and Stinky, he was injured even further, leaving him straight up in a full body cast that covered even his face. This might just be the actual worst injuries that we've seen Eugene face. Now, I hate to contradict myself a bit, but I can't help but wonder what this would have looked like if nobody had messed with Eugene's bike. Honestly, I've noticed time and time again in making this video that when Eugene faces danger, it's often caused by other people, in this case by Harold and Stinky and both their substantial injuries that he suffered. It just leaves me questioning repeatedly, is Eugene really a jinx or is he the victim of circumstance caused by others? As far as our perception of Eugene goes, this one definitely shined an interesting light on him. Like I said, I feel like this has been pretty well established by this point, but Eugene is a good person. We haven't really seen him do anything malicious or in spite of anyone. We never see him bullying anyone or being a jerk. He usually stays in his lane, keeping positive and acting respectfully. Now, this was the first episode we've came across today that changed that. During the scene where Rhonda is writing that anonymous note to Curly, Eugene is a part of the group of kids who's standing around Rhonda and laughing. Now, I get it. Kids will be kids, and it's rather common for kids to laugh at someone else's misfortunes, but this was a malicious act. Rhonda was writing that note in an effort to not only prank Curly, but to get him off of her back as an alternative to either asking him to stop or going to an adult for help regarding Curly. The fact that Eugene was in the background laughing just kind of felt out of character for him. He's not usually the one to laugh at someone else's expense. Him and Arnold particularly are the last people I'd expect to be standing around and laughing at a rather mean-spirited prank that was being pulled on one of their peers. Thankfully, Arnold did the right thing and tried to tell Rhonda not to do it, but Eugene couldn't resist the urge to get a laugh at someone else's expense in this one specific scenario. That scene in particular feels like a pretty decent transition to our next and final episode that we're going to check out today, and that's going to be the season 2 episode, Eugene Goes Bad. This is an episode that damn near contradicts pretty much all of the groundwork that we've laid for our understanding of Eugene as a character, but I can't talk about Eugene and not bring up this episode. It starts out at Eugene's house while him, Gerald, and Arnold are watching Eugene's favorite show. You have broken the law and now you must pay for your crimes. It's time to take you out to lunch. I knew the Amigator would catch that guy. He always does. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty cool, Eugene. He's my hero. 
He stands up for the little guy, the guy like me. He's the abdicator, defender of the poor, the weak, the clumsy. He's the greatest. Gerald explains that he's just a TV hero and that he isn't real, but Eugene argues saying that he is real and he's going to be in town tomorrow filming an episode of the show and that he has to meet him. We cut to the next day where Eugene, Gerald, and Arnold are on the scene of the set. It's time to take you out to lunch. This must be the big fight scene. The abdicator will cream this guy. See? He's a real hero, you guys. Okay, cut it. That's a print. Bring in the stuntman. Huh? Where's the abdicator going? Who's that guy? Eugene is stunned to find out that the abdicator doesn't do his own stunts but even more stunned when he hears the real abdicator talking. Where is my lunch? Where is my apricot juice? Where is my mushroom brioche? It's Hollywood, Eugene. I can't believe it. Come on, people. I have been working since 11 o'clock, and this suit is still too hot and confining. What do I have to do to get some help around here? I mean, the last time I looked in the trades, I was still a major television star. And he's whining like a baby. That's not the way the abdicator would act. Maybe he's just having a bad day. Eugene explains that the abdicator is supposed to be honest, brave, and polite no matter what, and that he's just a big faker. Boo! Boo! The abdicator stinks! Whoa! Ow! The abdicator's a fake! Boo! Hey, you're not allowed here. No fans can cross the barricade. Why isn't somebody on this? You're a fake. I'm just an actor. Yeah, well, to millions of kids, you are a hero. We looked up to you. But now I know the truth. You're nothing but a fake. Look, kid, it's just a role I play. Come on, you're a wimp. As Eugene storms off angry, Arnold and Gerald follow him. Arnold tries to reason with Eugene and explain that the guy is just an actor, but Eugene claims that if the abdicator is fake, then there's no reason to be good or honest anymore. Eugene goes home, and that night, he tears down his abdicator posters, throws all of his abdicator merch into his abdicator trash can, and tosses it into the dumpster. Eugene takes black paint and covers his walls in it as we see him in bed reading a book about how to go bad. The next day at school, we see bad Eugene standing in the hall near a fire alarm. He pulls it and everyone runs outside in a panic. Did you pull an alarm? So what if I did? Did you observe a fire in the vicinity? Hey man, there's no fire. Pulling the fire alarm without a probable cause is a violation of the school code and a very serious infraction. So, sue me. All right, that's it, that's it. In my office, right this minute, young man. Hey, that's not my scene, man. Eugene walks out of school, litters a gum wrapper, kicks over a bunch of bikes, and goes to the park where he cuts in front of Arnold in line for the water fountain. Arnold tries to talk to him about how he's changed and he isn't a nice kid anymore, but Eugene brushes him off. Why are you doing this? Because it's there. That doesn't even make sense. It's not complicated, Arnold. I used to be a nice guy. But somewhere along the line, I changed. And once a guy like me changes, there ain't no changing back. Got it? But Eugene, later for you. Later that night, Eugene walks out of his house, leaving the door wide open. Some kid approaches him, trying to talk to him, but Eugene is just a huge jerk to him. Hi, Eugene. Move it or lose it, spud. Is that all you got to say to me? What else would I say to a punk like you? Well, it used to be I thought you might give me some advice. It used to be I thought you might provide an example I could look up to and emulate. It used to be that because I was younger and smaller than you, I looked up to you as a hero, as an example of what I might be when I grew up. I used to look up to you, Eugene, but now that you've gone bad, I guess there's nothing for me to do, but, well, go bad too. The kid walks away, defeated, and based on the look on his face, I have to guess that his words stuck with Eugene. Meanwhile, we see a limo parked in the city. Last night I couldn't sleep. I kept thinking about what that clumsy kid said to me the other day. 
but how he always looked up to the abdicator. Every big star has one or two disgruntled fans. I was so troubled I woke up my neighbor to borrow a dictionary and look up the meaning of abdicator. It means to give up responsibility, to abandon your position without fulfilling your duties. I couldn't believe it. It left me haunted. This morning I was so upset I could barely work out. His agent tries to explain to him that he isn't a real hero and it's not his fault that Eugene was affected by what he saw, but the abdicator is just too racked with guilt over the situation, so he runs out of the limo to go take a walk. Meanwhile... So what if it's past my bedtime? I'm going out! And I might not be back till 9 o'clock! Not too far from there, Eugene is throwing tomatoes at a mural of the abdicator. Arnold and Gerald get off a nearby bus to try to talk some sense into Eugene, but he isn't buying it. He walks off and stumbles upon the kid from before, hanging from his fire escape a few stories up and begging for someone to help him. Eugene realizes that everybody needs a hero and he springs into action to save the kid. He climbs the fire escape and just narrowly catches the kid as he falls. Eugene falls as well and the two end up dangling from the fire escape while Eugene is hanging from his jacket. Everyone stands by watching, but it ends up being none other than the abdicator who springs into action and saves them. You saved me! You really are a hero! No, oh, I'm not a real hero. I'm just a highly paid TV star. But I still care about the kids who watch my show and look up to me, and I want them to do the right thing. Everybody needs a hero. Thanks, Abdicator. Eugene, you saved me. You shouldn't have been out here to begin with. It must be way past your bedtime. I'm supposed to be in bed by 8.30, right after my favorite show, Yo Ernest. Good, I'll take you home. Eugene, you're my hero. As Eugene and the kid walk away, Gerald says that he still thinks Eugene's a jinx and a geek. Arnold says that may be so, but he's something else too. A hero. The episode comes to an end as Gerald and Arnold walk away. This is yet another episode that really stuck with me as a kid. Growing up, my parents made a huge point of stressing about how shows, music, video games, movies, and most media are not accurate representations of real life. My parents did this because they didn't censor me at all. They let me play all the violent video games that I wanted and watch all the gnarly horror movies that I wanted as long as I grasped the fact that none of that was real and you can't just run over pedestrians in real life like you do in Grand Theft Auto. So at a very young and formative age, I had an understanding that all of the characters characters I was watching on TV weren't real and were just played by actors. Now, I guess Eugene never got that talk because he was so sure that the abdicator was a real hero. I totally get Eugene being affected by the realization that his biggest idol isn't the same way in real life as he is portrayed in the show, but Eugene kind of took it too far. I mean, he went as far as publicly ridiculing the actor playing the abdicator than going home, throwing away hundreds of dollars of merchandise and furniture and setting up his room with just a bed and black walls. He even kicked over and broke his TV. Ultimately, that realization had Eugene acting completely out of character. The normally happy-go-lucky and positive kid we were all used to had flipped a switch and became essentially the opposite. This not only affected him, but others around him as well. That little kid looked up to Eugene. He idolized Eugene and hoped that maybe someday he would grow up to be just like him. However, when Eugene went bad, so did that kid, and it led to a snowball effect that ultimately almost got the both of them killed. As they hung from that second story fire escape, it would have just taken Eugene letting go, or his jacket ripping, and they could have died hitting the pavement from that high up, or at minimum, cracked their skulls open. This episode is one that comes with some interesting life lessons to it. It's important to have idols. Everyone needs a hero, but that's relative. It's okay that the abdicator was just an actor on a show. It doesn't matter that he's not really in the streets fighting crime. What matters is the moral portrayed through his character. If that set of morals is what led to Eugene being the kid that he naturally is, then in my opinion, I think it's great that he idolizes the abdicator. Eugene is one of the few kids in the show who is routinely positive and looks at life with a glass half full mindset and always just wants to help everyone as much as he can. This may have possibly been the darkest chapter in Eugene's life, but he made it past it in stride and learned a lot from this whole situation. All in all, I can say that Eugene is an inspiring character who's been dealt a tough hand in life. 
Everyone at school treats him like crap except for Arnold. In a way, it's like he's been shunned from all social groups because of everyone branding him a jinx. Bad things happen to him, he gets hurt all the time, but for the most part, none of it's really his fault. I truly believe that Eugene, for the most part, has been dealt the hand that he's playing mostly by everyone surrounding him and that's really just sad. It's truly messed up that Eugene's been treated the way that he has been and labeled a jinx by everyone at school, when in all reality, the bad things that happen to him are usually at the fault of the same kids who are shunning him. But above that, Eugene is inspiring due to the fact that regardless of any bad things that happen to him, he still maintains a positive outlook on life and always looks at the glass half full. But above that though, it's astonishing that even though all the kids at school talk bad about him and don't like him for the most part, he still stays positive towards them and is open to being friends with all them. It takes really strong character for someone not to hold a grudge against people who've done them wrong, or labeled them as something they're not. It really does take a lot to still be welcoming to people who constantly try to tear you down or ridicule you. However, Eugene does it. The whole school has labeled him a jinx and tries to avoid him at all costs, but that doesn't cause him to hate everyone. Regardless of them wanting nothing to do with him, he still wants everything to do with them, and I'd say that really just speaks volume to the kind of person that Eugene is. But what do you think? Did this video change your perception of Eugene? Let me know in the comments down below. I always love seeing your guys' feedback. If you enjoyed this video, let me know what you thought about it and maybe share it with a friend. And as always, thank you all so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Peace.